Hey everybody, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to the Zeiss Ophthalmic Virtual Experience Summer Optometry Meeting 2020. And thanks so much for being here this morning, especially you folks out on the West Coast. I know it's a little early, so uh, you know, grab your coffee and let's get started here this morning. Um, so today we have a really great show for you that Zeiss has put together, and I can put it up on the site, on, on the page, so you can all see what I, I'm talking about here today. You know, uh, Zeiss has put together this program in the face of everything that's been going on with the pandemic over this uh, past several months. When everything first started to happen, Zeiss was very aggressive about putting together these educational programs, uh, and they've done a series of them, and, you know, sort of as summer is winding down now, um, you know, they've, they've brought us the summer show. And let me just quickly bring it up on the screen. So if you're watching this live stream uh, outside of the conference right now, if maybe you're seeing it on YouTube or in other places, uh, I welcome you to come in and register for the conference. And you'll see I'm at the registration page for the conference right now. Uh, you can see the URL is right up there at the top. Uh, and check it out. And we're, we're going to have a, lots of different stuff going on for you today at the show. In addition to this live stream, where you'll hear me interview a whole bunch of folks from the conference. Uh, we're also going to have two tracks of lectures going today, and you can see them up on the screen today. Uh, and so one track, the one on the left you can see there, is all about practice management during COVID-19. Now, I know that for many people, obviously, it's been a struggle. Uh, we heard in the beginning, you know, when this first started happening in February and March, obviously, practices were shut down. Then people started to slowly ramp up. And now we're hearing different kinds of practice management challenges where you're having people who are working from home a lot of the time and they have more time. And I'm actually hearing of practices now who are coming back strong uh, to the point where I've heard of some who are even booked out all the way through October. So different practices have different challenges depending on where you are. And we have three lectures today, you know, talking all about those practice management issues. Um, right side of your screen, you can see we have a clinical education track as well. Uh, you know, talking about retinal disease management and co-management, uh, practical approach to the glaucoma suspect, uh, and OCT interpretation from anterior to posterior. Of course, OCT interpretation is always uh, some of the most well-attended lectures in these types of seminars. It's something that people seem to have a, a, an unquenchable thirst uh, to learn about. So it should be cool, a lot of fun. And the interviews that I have for you today are with uh, a bunch of the folks who are giving these talks today to give us some background on what it is that they're talking about. Um, so that should be fun. So if you're hearing me right now, just be aware that at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, that's when these lectures will start. So uh, if you just don't feel like hanging around here listening to us, uh, you know, go back and forth in interviews, but you want to get some structured education, that's going to be the place to go at 11. And since we have a few minutes before uh, we, we have our first interviewee coming on here, let me just sort of review all the, the, the big sort of points that I wanted to hit about what's been going on with Zeiss over these past several months. Um, so if you've been paying attention uh, at all to the resources that they've put together, you know, they've done such a great job of, of putting together lectures and breath shields that you could uh, acquire from them for your instruments. And they had so many different resources that they decided to pool them all into one place on the web. Um, and you can see it right here on the screen, the Med Support Now page. And you can see the URL right here at the top. This is definitely one to bookmark, you see, and I've done it here. Um, so this is where Zeiss put together literally all of the resources that you'd need um, to learn sort of all about the new normal and have resources for your practice going forward. So uh, a lot of the education is here that they have. Um, you know, they have white papers. Uh, they can show you how to install breath shields and so forth. So this is sort of the, the, the page that you want to go to to learn all about what's been happening with them. So. If you take nothing else away from listening to me today, <laughs> remember this page, uh, because it, it really is the most important one to go to. Um, also, just as an aside, Covalent Careers, who put together this, this uh, conference today, and they did a great job doing it. This is a huge undertaking, so kudos to them, uh, having to run you know, multiple tracks of lectures at the same time and uh, to do this live stream. So they, they're sort of powering all of this today. Um, and what's, uh, they've also set up a page, and again, you can see it here on the Covalent Career site. Uh, you can see the URL right up there. Um, they've put together this professional education portal for Zeiss, so you can go and get your education here as well. Uh, and again, enter your email address if you want to, um, you know, learn when new educational modules are going to be released, and you'll obviously get it uh, straight away. So pretty cool stuff from Covalent. You can see all the different movies that they have up here and so forth. So I, 
a, a wealth of information, a panoply of information available uh, with covalent careers. So pretty cool stuff. Um, I'd also like to talk a little bit today about the uh, exhibit hall that's going on at the show. So it's not just lectures that we're having. It's not just this live stream. Uh, there's also an exhibit hall with product booths. So if you ever wanted to learn about different pieces of Zeiss equipment, this is a great way to do it virtually. You can go in, uh, you know, examine the equipment. They have videos, they have images. Uh, they also have people standing by. So if you want, you know, if you're actually interested in, in buying or want to learn more about the product, they have the product specialist uh, standing by there. So it's a great way to go in. You know, I, I realize that uh, there's no substitute um, for uh, sort of live uh, conferences, right, where you can touch things in person. And by the way, I forgot to even uh, introduce myself. Um, so for, for those of you who may or may not know me, um, so I am the chief technologist at CE Wire. That's probably how people uh, know me best. And CE Wire is obviously one of the largest virtual conferences in eye care. So that's, that's sort of um, my shtick, and I believe you know, greatly in doing remote education and, and uh, virtual education. Uh, and you can see CE Wire up there. But you know, as good as CE Wire is, and as good as all these other virtual events are, in some ways, you know, people uh, will always want to sort of try to be able to come in and touch and feel the hardware, right? Uh, I, I believe Gretchen Bailey once referred to Vision Expo as an equipment petting zoo. And I think that that's pretty accurate, right? You know, as human beings, we still like being able to go in and touch things. Unfortunately, these days, that is just not possible. Um, so this is, is the next best thing. Um, Zeiss and Covalent have set up really interesting booths that you can go in and visit uh, to learn all about the equipment. And fortunately, you know, the equipment that Zeiss makes uh, really um, lends itself to this virtual format. Uh, because obviously, you know, images are, are their stock and trade, and so you can very easily go in and not only see images, but you can also see the user interface of a lot of their devices as well. Uh, so it's really easy to kind of go in and, and check it out online, so highly recommended. And just as an aside, I know that in speaking to a lot of the, the sales and marketing folks at Zeiss and other companies, they really like these, the virtual format because they don't have to carry any equipment with them. <laughs> you never really think about it, but actually setting up the equipment um, at trade shows is a, a major undertaking. So uh, by you know, doing it in this format, not only do, are they spared from having to do that, but they can service more people you know, much more rapidly in a virtual format. And you can see here up on the screen um, the idea that, that there are folks from Zeiss who are sitting in the uh, exhibit hall just waiting to talk to you. So it's pretty cool stuff. Um, and I think we are all just about ready for our first guest. So let me... Uh, flip this off and see if uh, I can do this without blowing the entire system up, right? That would probably be a, a bad thing. And there we go. Let me see. And Angelo, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes. Great. So, Angelo, how are you doing this morning? It's a great morning. Sun is out. All good. Excellent. Excellent. And I know you're, you're out in California. And, and how's it going there? Any smoke or is it pretty clear? Well, it's it's dissipated, uh, but it was quite challenging over the weekend, for sure. At least in the area I'm in, I think there's still quite a few uh, challenges across the state. Yep. Yeah, and even up here in Oregon, we're getting a little bit of your your smoke, so I can only imagine what it's like. Uh... Oh, we're you're you're we're exporting. Yes, you're exporting. <laughs> That's exporting. A, a, it's a polite way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Angela, I wanted to ask you. The last time we spoke, it was uh, it's been a couple months already, um, yeah, or longer. So, so what's been going on with you, and what's been going on at Zeiss? Well, um, you know, it, it's interesting. That the last time we spoke uh, with this audience, um, we were just coming into this, right? It was March or so. Uh, we were in a in a hurry to figure out what we could do to help, and uh, I think at that time we started with slit lamp. Uh, breast shields uh, and that donation program. But um, if you go now to the Med Support Now page, you'll see that we've completed the breast shields for, for all of our products. Uh, we've got protective coverings um, and we've put in the social distancing uh, technologies um, that we needed for, uh, for things like Cirrus and HFA. So we've, we've kind of put all that in place. Um, and, uh, and establish that for our customers. Um, and now we're transitioning to uh, looking at other aspects of the workflow within the practice. Uh, 
as, as practices start to reopen and try to deal with this intermediate state we're in, um, how to manage their practices in the current uh, with the current challenges. Right. And, you know, I've actually spoken to a bunch of practices over the last several weeks. And even in that short period of time, things have seemed to change a little bit. And I'm not sure if it's because of the you know so-called back to school period or if it's because states mm-hmm. are are opening up a little more. But I've had doctors who told me, you know, things were dead, dead, dead lots of downtime. Now, all of a sudden, they're swamped again. So their challenges have just suddenly, it's like a 180, it just suddenly shifted. Yeah. And it, it's, um, it, it, I think we're going to see some, uh, you know, some peaks and valleys, um, depending on the current situation. Um, I, I think for optometry, um, you know, what we're hearing as we, um, talk to practices as they're reopening is, is thinking about how to become resilient over time, right? They're, you know, we back in March and, and for a long time, we've been talking about this new normal. I don't think we're in the new normal yet. We're until there's a vaccine and we see how buying practices, medical practices, uh, what patients want to do, how that's going to change. Um, I don't know that we've hit the new normal. We're just in this in-between time. And I think that uh, many of the practice owners are looking forward saying, hey, if this happens again, how do I ensure that I'm ready for that? And, and, um, and that's really open to conversation about expanding the, the medical capabilities in optometry. And candidly, I think that's the right thing. Um, I, I believe I've made this comment before. If I look at healthcare systems around the world, and it, we, we talk about the US situation, um, a lot. Um, and we know that there's a, a financial crisis. If I think about the aging population and now you add COVID and all the other things, um, you look around the world, there's a similar problem. And so there needs to be a fundamental change in how patients are cared for. And candidly, patients are going to also ask for that, right? They're, they're going to become more of consumers in the health systems versus just a patient that says, well, I just have to follow the path. And I think this is where I see, especially the fourth, the people who are at the forefront of this, thinking about how they're going to change their practices to ensure that they can be successful in the long term and not just in this intermediate state. Right. And in fact, I know a lot of practices who have sort of retooled their workflow over these past several months, and they're just now starting to get to implement these changes in workflow and seeing sort of how they're how they're working out. Um, in a very sort of trial by fire way. So it's kind of an interesting time that we're in. It is. And, and I think many of these practices, the one thing that, that isn't going to change very quickly is the real estate you have, your literal physical space. Right. And so on one hand to say, look, I need to um, adjust my practice um, and maybe expand my medical capabilities. On the other hand, you, you, the space you're renting is the space you're renting, right? And so, or owning, <laughs> Um, so I think these are the challenges, you know, we, we see and understand. So it's, there's, there's constraints that, that you have to manage. And, you know, if we think through this, you really, what I see practices doing really is laying out their business model, right. And saying, you know, how many patients, and this is where uh, the Zeiss team can support, you know, where, where can come alongside those customers and understand how to expand that practice within reason, within the, the, uh, the amount of cash that's available for capital, which is not a lot uh, in some cases, and really looking at the productivity of those devices you're going to bring in, right? And, and um, things like the uh, Claris, right? We, we very specifically designed that product where, where we're bringing the optics to the patient. And, and uh, the fact that we're doing uh, true color, uh, the fact that you have the, that um, wide field that it captures the seven fields in a single 133 degree shot is, is really critical for that efficiency element. So it's not just about, oh, how do I bring a technology into my practice and expand the medical element? It's how am I going to recreate the workflow within my practice so I don't create bottlenecks because there's still people going to come in and I need to fit them for contact lenses or, or glasses. And so it's an element of not disrupting your practice in a negative way, but in a positive way. And, um, and these investments are critical. If you think about glaucoma, there's a lot of glaucoma that's managed in, in optometry and, and being able to use, for instance, CETA faster um, in, in, 
in the sense that um, if you've got a patient that you've been managing for a while and you need to have a, 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 an efficient workflow through your practice, simply because the social distancing, the masking, the disinfection in between patients, um, utilizing something like CETA Faster allows you to ensure that you're creating that, that care for that patient, that experience that they need, but at the same time, ensuring that you're keeping them safe, you're keeping your staff safe, and you're being efficient. And these are the things that, you know, we've, we've evolved these products over time and CETA Faster was available before COVID, but um, and no, those technologies were being developed because we knew that the aging population was going to impact practices. COVID has just accelerated so many things, right? Telehealth is one everybody talks about, but, but there's so many other things that have been accelerated uh, with COVID. And one is really the efficiency at which you, you need to move a patient through uh, the practice. I mean, I don't know how it is for you. You know, everything from, you know, a haircut to a, a, a dental cleaning has changed, right? How you interface, what you're allowed to do, what you wait in the parking lot, how, what happens when you enter the doorway, all these things have changed and they've changed in ophthalmology and optometry as well. And, um, and this is where I say we're in this intermediate state where, it might be slower now and we're going to have some point in the future where we'll be in between where we were pre COVID and where we are during uh, this pandemic. And I, I think lastly in, in this thought that I have is that data and, and I'm hearing more and more teleconsultations. Zoom is a, is a perfect example and um, using things like a glaucoma workplace or a retina workplace um, through a zoom call to, to, to communicate to the patient um, if you're doing um, a call later with the patient to just be able to describe the progression of their disease is also a very uh, efficient way to manage that data instead of having to flip through three different views of data and different devices. Everything's consolidated. You, you can see progression. So these are the kinds of things that I think that we'll see more and more of um, as, uh, as practices are, are reopening and reshaping um, what's happening in, in opt optometry. Yep. In fact, I heard from a few doctors who are now starting to think about who are the patients that I really actually need to physically see, right? Yep. And trying to figure out in their workflows, you know, who are, who is that subset of patients that absolutely must need to be seen versus yep. those who I don't even have to have on, on my premises. Yep. And, um, and I, I, you know, I guess this will soften Adam, maybe, um, as the vaccine comes in, but, I don't know that it goes completely away because we still have the aging population, right? We still have all the other stressors on the health system. And I, I still believe in, you know, I, I think it's great to have ophthalmolo ophthalmology and optometry at the table at the same time they have this conversation. You know, there are successful programs where uh, patients are being managed cooperatively between different practices. Um, and um, if I look at, for instance, the UK, I think I've mentioned this in some of your interviews before, there, there, those changes have already happened between optometry and ophthalmology. And um, I think the important thing is to ensure that optometry is prepared for where uh, healthcare is going, because there's, a, I think, a very uh, great opportunity. Absolutely. Great. And, and how about Zeiss in general? You know, I know in the beginning, the thing that, uh, you know, we were worried about or I was, with supply chain, right, for everything, not not just for you guys, but for the entire world, right? Will business be able to function? Can you get spare parts for things? Can, you know, can manufacturing continue and so forth? How have you guys been, been handling that as the pandemic has sort of evolved? Well, you know, that's interesting. I, I think that um, we're very fortunate, being the largest ophthalmic diagnostic company in the world, that we have a pretty strong supply chain and we've been doing it for a long time. But what we're seeing, you know, it's like the body, right? You've got the core of the blood, uh, the circulation system. And then as you get farther out, uh, it gets a little smaller. Um, where we're seeing risk and where we're seeing challenges in our supply chain is really those small uh, tech companies, not, not your high tech companies, but your small tech companies that are very good at certain things like, you know, optics or whatever, smaller uh, um, companies that, that deal with specific materials where the pandemic has really closed them down, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 their, their business wasn't large. It was a, a handful of people. 
um, that made a very specific technology. And, and they're the ones that are struggling because they're, they're locked in. Uh, they don't have a lot of choices if, if you see a dip in, um, in revenues. And so we're seeing a little bit of that on the outskirts. Uh, you know, we're, again, very fortunate that we have options in our supply chain to be able to move things around so it doesn't impact our supply of our devices to our customers. But there's clearly a challenge. And that varies by country. Uh, we have a global supply chain. Uh, we have technologies for many different um, uh, nations that come into our products. And uh, there are some areas of the world that are more challenged than others. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, I think it's going to be fascinating to see what happens over the next several months, right? I, nobody has a crystal ball. But it, but if you did have, you know, if you want to you know, bust out your crystal ball here just for a second, what do you think maybe over the next six months? Or I'm, I don't think there's going to be a vaccine probably that's widely available until winter, I would imagine or maybe even a little later. So what do you think over the next several months? Where do you think things are going to go? <laughs> um, yeah, I wish I had a crystal ball, yeah. uh, right? We all do. Um, you know, uh, we, we look at uh, the economic recovery because, of course, Zeiss runs a global business. So we, we, we're in semiconductors. We're in, um, we're in automotive. So, so we're very fortunate that we have access to data that's, that's much broader than just ophthalmology and optometry. And um, what we're seeing is um, a pretty slow uh, recovery. Um, so I would argue that um, the rest of this calendar year, we're in this intermediate state as we are. I'm, I am really reluctant to say that we're going to have a vaccine. I just had a call with China uh, last night. Um, the head of our business in China and, and the, in China, they claim they're going to have something this year, a vaccine available for COVID. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of hope and which I, I think is great, but I think reality is that we're probably looking well into 2021 because before we have a, a broadly distributed vaccine uh, available. So we're in this intermediate state um, I would guess for at least another six to nine months. That that's my my gut. I, again, that's not Zeiss's answer. It's Angelo's answer. Looking into my virtual crystal ball, right. but maybe I'm a little skeptical. This is why I think that we can't ignore what we're learning today in the management of of, of the practice because we're going to be living with it for a while. We're not two weeks away, and um, and I think it's really important for us to be prudent. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned, you know, I saw something yesterday in, in, in part of my investor portfolio where uh, Warby Parker, I think, is now three, worth three billion. Um, and they call it a startup, right? Um, clearly, consumers are making different decisions. I, I, if I look at, um, and my wife's not on this, so I'll tell you. Uh, if I look at how much my wife has spent on Amazon in 2020 versus 2019, uh, I can tell you there's a shift in how people are, are uh, spending their money and how they're interacting and, and buying things. And so, you know, this is where I'm, I'm not sure in this intermediate state, will it stay there or, or post vaccine will, will things retreat back to some position between pre COVID and where we are now. Um, and I, I believe that's true. I believe, you know, I I'm hearing, and I don't know, Adam, what you hear. I, I think in person, in our personal lives, not being able to socialize, even children not being able to go to school. My, my One of my daughters is a school teacher um, at the high school level. I mean, this virtual environment is tough for kids. And the younger they get, I think it's even tougher. It, it's, and um, yeah. the human needs other humans to socialize with. And Zoom is great, but at some point, it's, it's, it's not the human you know, interaction that you, you really er, you know, need as a human. Yeah, I have an 11 year old, so I'm, I'm acutely aware of what's <laughs> what's been going on. You know, I can only you know play so many Fortnite matches with him, but I'm not a good substitute for his friends. Right. Um, exactly. So it is, it's 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 been a, a real challenge. And um, but, yeah, it's been a, a, an interesting experience is learning how to adapt to it. Um, and perhaps, you know, in the end, when when this is all over, you know, whenever that is, you know, maybe we'll just come to appreciate, you know, when we get back to a, a better normal eventually. Yeah. And I, I, I think that, you know, there is some concern that 
that COVID is only the beginning of, of some of these uh, pandemics with the globe as it is. Now, you know, travel is quite restricted, right? I mean, if, if, um, if you want to go to another country, you know, you, you're talking about testing, you're talking about self-quarantine, same thing coming back into the country. You know, the, the travel industry is a concern and, and we shouldn't underestimate how important travel is to the economy. Um, and and um, if people feel like they can go and, and explore and, and enjoy and business, <laughs> um, you know, I, I haven't traveled since January, I think, or February. So, so uh, and that's unusual for me. And I think this is a challenge also for our industry to, to be able to get together and, and really, uh, you know, work through things. I, I think these virtual events are great. Uh, and they're, uh, you know, if we wouldn't have had them, I don't know what we would have done. Uh, but it, but on the other hand, I think you know getting together and and um, and enjoying company of others with with, with and, and sharing ideas is is a lot different than in a virtual world. Absolutely. Well, you know, hopefully some, sometime next year we'll get to see each other in person again. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All right, Angela. Well, thanks so much for being here today, and thank you for putting this on. You know, it's 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 you know always fun to do this, and these events have been incredibly helpful for people. So thank you again for producing them. Oh, no worries. We have a great team and, um, you know, we're really excited about today's uh, sessions and um, it's really an opportunity to share because we're learning as much as others are learning. So, um, you know, in an this is, gives us a great opportunity to learn. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Take care. All righty. So. I think we're almost uh, coming up to 11 o'clock and uh, our next uh, interviewee will be here in a second. But before we do that, let me uh, pop up on the screen here. Let me show you what's been going on here. So let me, again, if you're watching this somewhere not inside the meeting, you know, you might want to jump on in um, because the uh, 11 a.m. lectures are starting up very soon. Adapt adapting to today's workplace, obviously important, um, you know, in the context of everything that's been going on here. So we want to give that a shot. And uh, renal disease management and co-management then and now also coming. Testing, testing. Soon. Can That's you hear it. me? And it sounds like we have our next guest uh, coming in. Do uh, it looks like Dr. Ramsey. So yes, Dr. Ramsey, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, I can hear you. I'm using the microphone from the computer. Is that working? Yep, you sound good. Let me uh, pull you up here on the screen and we will be in good shape. So... Hopefully, Dr. Fulmer will be in here in a minute. And let me, uh, before, before we start uh, uh, talking to you guys, I just want to remind everyone that the lectures are starting here momentarily. Um, so if you go to the live education agenda, you can see adapting to today's workplace is starting in retinal disease management and co-management then and now. So you get an overview of, of how things were and how things are, are changing, uh, particularly these days. So that should be good. And... Let me pull you on up here. So uh, I'll put you up on screen here. Okay. Let's see if I can fix that. Getting a little feedback from something here. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ramsey, you're there. <laughs> How's it going? It's going great. Excellent. Okay, and I think we're just going to wait here for a minute for Dr. Fulmer to get here. Hopefully, uh, she'll find her way in the room. Um, and if not, we will, uh, you know, get get going ahead here, because um, I know that you guys have a. Talk. This is live. So people can see me, right? This oh, is yeah. live, correct? Yep, everyone can, can see you and can see me. And in fact, hey. you, you can you can probably yeah see yourself in my in my window, right? So yeah. I'm talking, so that's okay. what everyone else is seeing. So yeah. You guys got the technology over here man you guys you got an a1 with this right now we're, we're trying we're trying so uh you know for better for better or worse <laughs> but i know that you have a talk coming up uh, later today about the medically minded practice so that should be yes. a good one and that's at like uh, i think at one o'clock eastern one o'clock eastern i mean when people start saying times i make the assumption it's eastern you know anybody else you know you guys got to come over to eastern standard time when we give times out it's got to be eastern okay. central pacific no 
Totally. No, I, 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 you know, I live, I live on the West Coast, right? I live in Portland, so I know when someone throws out a time, it's Eastern time. Like that's just it's the way Eastern it is. Eastern time. That's what it is. Like unless specified, it is Eastern time. Well, it's you know, because like even watching like sports, right? You know, when you hear time, when someone says it, it's like, oh yeah, that's Eastern, and so you adapt. Like I know, you know, when I get home at five p.m., oh yeah, I'm going to be able to watch all the stuff on the East Coast, right? Because it's eight o'clock. So it's it's funny how you mentally shift everything just living out here. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the hard part is when people from the West Coast try to schedule stuff, I'm like, do y'all know that's 9 o'clock at night? Like, do you know, you know that? <laughs> or like when they schedule these talks and they want it to be across the nation and they want it to start at 6, because they don't know, 6.30 Pacific. I'm like, it's 9.30. Right. You know, like, my wife is looking at me like, are you crazy? No, we're not doing that. Yeah, it's funny. I take so many meetings out here at, you know, 7 in the morning, 6.30 in the morning, and it's totally cool because you just get used to it. Um and I have friends who work in the financial industry here, and they're in at work at 4 a.m. I mean, it's just the way it is. You know, if you choose to live out here, you just get used to it. You get you get used to it. And I get used to taking hey, everybody. Taking, okay, hey. Hey. We're, we're letting them know that everything has to be Eastern Standard Time. That's all. We're having a sidebar conversation in front of the whole thing. <laughs> That's right. Dr. Fulmer, where are you? Are you on the West Coast or East Coast? I'm in Alabama, so I'm Central. Okay, so you're right in the middle. So you, you get kind of yep. both ends of this, right? <laughs> I do, yeah. I can work with one hour difference. You know, <laughs> one hour is, is, is okay difference. When you get to the three hour difference, no, 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 no. Let's, yeah. let's, let's shut this down. Yeah, you I gotta know, get off work earlier. I mean, I've been, here, I've been here in the studio since 5 a.m. and it's like, whatever, it's totally cool. I'm, I'm used to it. So I, I adapt to the East Coast people, so it's all good. So, um, so thanks so much for being here today, guys. You know, I know you have that lecture coming up and I'll flash it up on the screen again for everyone um, so they can see it again. You know, okay. so you can see that that's at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern time, the medically minded practice. So maybe you, you guys could just tell us a little bit about yourselves and your practices just to give everybody some background. Yeah, absolutely. Adam, you want to take it first? No, ladies, hey, I'm not going to be rude. Come on now. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, I'm Dr. Patricia Fulmer. I am out of Huntsville, Alabama. Um, I currently practice in a group practice, a very medical based um private practice here in Huntsville, suburb of Huntsville, um, but I'm actually in the process of opening my own practice. So that's a fun, exciting time. Um, should be open around November. It's been a little bit of a crazy year to do that, but hey, why not? Um, so really excited for you guys to, to be with us for the lecture today. Um, Adam and I are both really passionate about medical optometry and uh, just helping people incorporate that into their practices because we've both done it and we love it. And it, it's certainly a practice builder. So excited for today. Great, great, great. I'm super excited for your practice to be up and I want to see all the pictures and all and, and all the stuff. Uh, I know you're going to have it looking diggy because you get the opportunity to look at everybody else. So you got to one up them. You got to one up that. I know, so right? Go for it. But you're, you're getting the medical model from the beginning. You're not adding it in. You're starting from the beginning. So mm -hmm. uh, my name is Dr. Adam Ramsey. I practice in uh, Palm Beach Gardens, uh, Florida. I own uh, Socialite Vision. For those who want to know what Palm Beach Gardens is, you got Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Palm Beach Gardens, then Orlando. That's where that's where we are. Give you the logistics of where 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 I am in Florida. There, um, and uh, my practice is a boutique practice. Uh, we do cool contacts. We do funky different glasses, and uh, we practice medical optometry. Uh, medical optometry here, and I have all the little gadgets and every nook and cranny. Uh, my staff know when I when I go to a conference, I'm coming back with something, um, and they when I walk in, they're like, "What did you buy now?" Um, and, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty fun. They, they just kind of, kind of expect it. I'm excited that we're going to have a talk later today in which we're going to share, uh, some of the things that we're doing and how we're implementing the medical model and how it can be done in any practice setting, no matter where you are currently and how you practice, you can go one step up and you can one, make one shift over to practicing more medically in any actual practice setting. Um, and that's what we try to make it a simple, easy, fun conversation um, in which we're going to give you some tools um, and have a nice little honest dialogue about how practicing medically in your practice can be done and can be done easily. Right. And, you know, th that's a, an interesting point you bring up because a lot of people are sort of scared to dip their toe in the water, right? They feel like, I, I don't know if this is for me, if I can do it. I work in a commercial setting. I, you know, I, I see 40 patients a day. I don't know if I can do this. What would you say to someone who just wants to try to get started with this? 
First of all, I want to say you can. I mean, that's the, the you can't do this mindset that's going to keep you from doing anything new that you want to do. So first of all, let's strike that. But, um, but really, truly, anybody can do this. It's not a, you don't have to have every single piece of equipment out there. You can be a cold start. You can be a, you know, 20, 30 year established practice and bring it in at any point because it's simply a change in your mindset. It's a it's change in the way that you schedule your patients. It's a change in the way that you communicate with your patients and make sure that they know why and what you're doing and how, and um, really just that that patient education and taking that extra time to to schedule and bring them back for the follow ups and make sure um, that they know why that's happening. It's, it makes all the world of difference when it comes to compliance and making sure that the medical model works for you. So it absolutely can be done no matter what modality you're in. And I think um, sometimes people, the medical model becomes scary to people, right? Because the medical model means that no matter if my practice is two minutes old, I must have $200,000 worth of equipment in my store. With, and that's the only way I can practice medically. And I would say that's a lie. Uh, you, Those toys are great. And I do have those toys. I'm not saying I don't, but I didn't start with those toys. And I was still the same optometrist and I was still the same doctor when I didn't have all those toys. And I added one every year. At the end of the year, my account knew that I was going to buy something. And I bought something and I added it and I added it and it grew. But you can still practice medically with a few things and then just grow along the way. Um, nobody should feel uh, threatened or feel like they can't do it if they don't have everything. No, you have something. I, almost every office got something. And you can, wherever you are, start with where you are. And then as you grow and you realize um, that, you know, you're seeing more medical patients than you think about, when you go back and look at your profit and loss and you go back and look in your EHR, you'd be like, oh, I saw a lot of dry eye. I saw a lot of diabetics. I didn't realize I was seeing that many. Um, and then you can go back and see that, yes, my practice can't afford some of these tools. Um, it, they, 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 it, can, it can afford it right now. Um, and you just get them one at a time. So we, we're, we're trying to simplify it um, and make it so that it's, a, it's attainable for everybody, no matter what practice setting. Um, and you can grow and practice to the full extent of your license and whatever you can do in the state that you are in. Uh, we are encouraging uh, people to practice to that full extent of the scope that's possible there. Um, and just do it step by step. Um, and eventually you will have all the toys. But until then, use the toys you got. Um, and then look through and see. Uh, I would challenge you that you probably can get one more toy. Maybe not all of them, but you can probably get one more than you have right now. Right. right. You know, it's funny. Uh, Angela Rago was just on. We were just talking. We had a conversation. He was talking about Warby Parker with their $3 billion valuation. Billion, you know, billion with a B. And wouldn't it be great to not really have to worry about what Warby Parker is doing, right? To try to diversify away and, and you know, do other things in your practice. So you have to worry a little bit less about all this. Um, so, you know, I think that pursuing the model that you guys have obviously makes you much less reliant and, and have to worry a lot less about other things that are going on on the retail side of the business. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the medical model doesn't mean that you're not ever doing glasses or contacts, right? I mean, this is a whole patient where so we're treating everyone and doing everything that they need, um, just maybe not all in one visit. And so when it comes time for their annual exam and they're there to use their, their vision insurance and that's what they want to do, when you've already built that rapport with them, they trust you, they understand you, they know that you know what's best for them as a whole patient, not just a pair of glasses or contacts. Um, it absolutely does build your optical and build your content lens sales. And there's still going to be some people that walk with their prescriptions because that's just the nature of, of the way that things are now. And that's okay because you still have those patients in their medical you know, follow-ups and their, their visits or diabetic exams, whatever it may be. And you can still build on that. And, you know, maybe they go to Warby one year and they come back the next year and say, you know, doc, I uh, probably should have listened to you. I might should have done something a little different or yeah, I still have a lot of computer strain because, you know, we didn't get those, those computer glasses you recommended or whatever the case may be, but it all builds together. So it, it certainly makes you more independent of having to worry about some of these outside forces. I would challenge anybody that is concerned about another office to think about car dealerships. BMW is not concerned what Kia is doing. Uh, BMW or Mercedes is not concerned what Honda is doing, right? They are operating in the same city, maybe on the same street across from one another. But the sale and the, and the, and the product that I put out is not competition for somebody else. Now, there's nothing wrong with driving a Honda, a Kia, or a BMW. It is your choice and it's your preference. The issue is optometrists try to be all things to all people. And you cannot. You need to figure out who your customer base is and who do you serve. And if you know who that is 
and you can articulate that and know my customer, then what somebody else is doing is not a problem. And I have no problem with any of these other companies. Warby Parker, 1-800-CONTACTS, they are serving a customer base that I am not serving. And they are going after a customer that is not my customer. And if your customer does not know the difference between your office and theirs, that is a fault on you, not on Warby Parker and not on 1-800. Um, so I look to myself and say, if a customer can't tell the difference and they have the same product and they sell it for cheaper, then that's on me, not on them. So um, I, I, I challenge anybody to make sure we look at our own practice and look at our own thing and have a separation to where when they do an exam in my office, they know the difference. So when they go somewhere else, they, they struggle to see the same thing. Or when they buy a product from me, they are educated enough to know the difference between this branded product, product and a private label product or whatever somebody else is offering. Um, and that's what I love about high tech and uh, all, all the toys is that when you go somewhere else and they don't have the toys, um, they actually can tell the difference in the exam because they were educated. So um, know who you are, know who you serve, and then you wouldn't be concerned or be shaking in your boots. Of, Online sales went from went from three percent to three point four percent. Oh my God! Right. No, calm down. That's that's not my concern. It's not my it's not my customer base. Right. In fact, you just made a really great point about marketing. You know, some people are scared they're going to invest in this medical model and they're not going to have the patient base, right? How do you guys market, you know, your medical services? Do you do it actively? Do you let people know, you know, what your practice is about, that you're, that you're more medically oriented? What's the best way to do it? Yes, I mean, I think there's a lot of different approaches and a lot of it has to do with what you're comfortable with. I think social media is a really cool way to, to utilize that without feeling like you're pushing something a little too much. Um, Really, you know, you can use your waiting room. I know um, Adam and I have talked before and he's, you know, likes to put things up in his waiting room. I completely agree with that. You can have videos running, showing some of your technology when they're waiting. Although, you know, right now with waiting in the car and things like that, you should probably look to do maybe a little more social media. But, you know, display these new diagnostic things that you're getting. Show your new toys. Show what you can do and why you can do that so that it doesn't become, you know, if you're offering a baseline test, people understand why. Um, again, it goes back to to education and just really letting the public know what you have um, because people are going to appreciate that when they understand what and why you why you're doing what you're doing so um, you know I don't think from a medical side it has to be so much a per se marketing tool as it is an educating tool um, from a, a standpoint but I like to use social media because um, quick clips get people's attention uh, they you know they'll watch a 30 second video on something and be like oh wow look at what this office has you know like like Adam said when they go somewhere else and they don't have that then they recognize it so um, just putting out some fun fun technological stuff is really in my opinion one of the best ways to do that um, yes putting out on social media is great uh, but I would say is that you build a medical model from the patient sitting in your chair mm -hmm. almost everybody has some diagnosis if you look if you look hard enough if you ask the right question um, and I put as much content out on social media and e-blast e and we we send out newsletters and print media and everything. And at the end of the day, the patient's sitting in your chair asking for those minus two contacts. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you realize that the A1C is 10. Uh, now you have a medical, uh, a medical model uh, patient. So uh, you can do everything and we can try all the other stuff. But at the end of the day, work the patients in your, in, in, that come into your office and you grow the medical model as your practice grows. Or... If your practice is already big and you say, I don't have a medical model, I would challenge you to ask the right questions, to look back at that health history form. Uh, it is impossible you don't have any diabetics and no high blood pressure, no dry air allergies. Um, if they're not telling you, they're telling somebody else and they're talking to the pharmacist at CVS to get drops. Um, so uh, it is right in your practice. Um, you can do the external stuff and I do it, but I, it's cheaper and more cost effective to gain and grow your existing patient than it ever is to try and get a different patient that from across the street to drive over to me because I have a fancy machine. Um, it'd be very difficult uh, to, to do that and it might be very cost, costly to do that. Um, I would tell you to, to work the patients in your waiting room um, and when the patient's sitting in your chair and they want, they want the minus two colored contacts, um, also ask them if their eyes itch and a lot of times they say yes. Right. Yes. And I would add to that real quick. Uh, one, if you're going to spend your time marketing and outside of doing some, you know, fun little clips here or there, spend your time marketing to your other providers, co-manage with people, yep. let your primary care doctors know, let your pediatricians know, um, make sure that people that would refer to you understand what all you can do because 
those patients, as Adam said, may not be telling you that their eyes itch, but they may be telling their pediatrician or their primary care, and then they can, you know, filter those patients into you. So that's sure. another area you can definitely funnel marketing to if you really want to. Sure. So if you guys had to give just one tip, <clears throat> if people take away nothing else and they just have one tip to get started with a medical model, what would it be? Uh, for me, it would be just look for it. Take the time, look for it, completely remove the hurdle of I can't do it and just start booking a little bit here and there. See how it goes and add to that. Don't don't try to start with, you know, the mountain. Go one step at a time and and it will come over time, no matter what kind of practice you're in. Great. And I would say uh, ask the right questions. Um, if you ask the right questions, you'll get the right answer. If you're not getting the right answer, you're probably asking the wrong question. So the medical model to me is actually a, a, a more deep case history, um, more than any, more than anything else. It is the appropriate case history, um, and if you ask the right uh, questions, you'll know the answer and you'll know the diagnosis before you even look at the patient. So slow down. I think a lot of a lot of times we jump right on. Patient comes in, say hello, pull the soot lamp over. Slow down. Talk to the patient. Look at the patient, um, and uh, your medical model will grow. From, from that. Great. All right. Well, Patricia, Adam, thank you so much for doing this today. And again, everyone, your, your talk is going to be coming up relatively soon, right? We can pull it up here and see. It's going to be coming up and people can ask you questions, right? When, when they're at the talk. So, you know, hopefully people won't be shy today. <laughs> so there we go. So medically minded practice coming up 1 p.m. Eastern time. And that's coming up in just a little bit. So again, thank you both for being here today. And, uh, and I look forward to watching your talk. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. All righty. So coming up on 8.15 Pacific time, 11.15 uh, uh, Eastern time. And let me quickly run through what's going on out there. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the Med Support Now page one more time. So um, if you if you get nothing else from this talk today on the live stream, that just know that Zeiss has pulled together all of their resources. Uh, onto this one page. So anything that you need to know about adapting to the new normal is here on this page. Uh, definitely go and check it out. Um, you know, they have a lot of their educational content as well. Things like breath shields, um, movies, and, and showing you basically how to social distance. Actually, you can see it here. They have it for all the, the different specialties that they, that they serve as well. Uh, but Jermaine, to you guys, right down here, um, you know, you can get advice on how to disinfect things. You can order breath shields. And we're actually gonna be talking to one of the managers behind the breath shield program in just a little bit, uh, so we can learn more about that and why they, they got into it. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. And as you can see here, you can also uh, look at some of the lectures that uh, they've produced. And Covalent Careers, the folks behind producing uh, the event today, have set up a portal for Zeiss with a lot of their education in one place. So this is also a lot of fun. You can go check it out, pop your email address right in that page, uh, in that form, and then anytime there's some new education that comes out, they will send it to you. And you can see a lot of the on-demand education is right up here on their page. And in just a few minutes, we're gonna be talking to Ben Turley from Zeiss. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me, he's the uh, all things OCT. Um, so hopefully Ben will get here in a little bit. In the interim though, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to share with you, you know, why I sound the way I do today. So um, what's funny is, you know, we do these events all the time and, and I, I probably have been on camera more hours than I can count now over the past uh, year or so. But <laughs> what happened down here, you know, you can see that I'm in my usual studio. If you watch these things, you know this is where I usually do things from. Over the past month, uh, the this, this studio area here took on a huge amount of water damage um, and was basically destroyed. So, you know, while we have a minute, I can just sort of show you, you know, disaster pictures, which ever, everyone loves disasters, right? Um, <clears throat> but we, we, you know, got everything back together literally at the last second. And this is what it looks like underneath the place now, you know, finally all cleaned up. But literally, we were putting up the drywall like yesterday to get the place finally ready. Uh, to to broadcast today. So I'm really uh, grateful to everyone who put in the effort to try to put the place back together uh, in time for this today. But if I, if I sound a little bit weird or, or strange today, just because I'm inhaling so many fumes <laughs> from the drywall and everything else, and if you hear a little whirring in the background, that is a fan uh, just trying to clear everything out here. So... <laughs> 
uh, it is it is a thing. Uh, occasionally, you do have some disasters. But of course, one thing that I, I've learned, you know, you can I guess uh, there are a lot of takeaways from from anything that happens to you, even disasters like that. Um, you know, it's been funny dealing with people traipsing through the offices here, fixing it over the the past month in the middle of a pandemic. Right, it's the last thing you want is a you know a million different contractors coming through. Um, but one thing that that you I guess learn about is the importance of clear communication. Um, the best folks who I was working with were very clearly communicating to me everything that they were doing along the path to rebuilding this place. So, of course, in that situation, they were the experts and I was the guy who had no idea, right? So it's sort of a, a role reversal um, from what most of us experience in our work lives. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's unusual to be in that situation. And it's just funny to remember that communication is probably the most important thing, obviously being Having some baseline level of competence is really important too, but clearly throughout this whole process, the most important thing was communication. So always nice to get a reminder of that. Um, you know, people like to talk about it, but uh, you know, finally getting to see it in action. One other thing I'd like to sort of review with people today too, um, I can pull it back up on the screen again uh, to show you. Um, besides the Med Support Now page, you know, Zeiss has a huge exhibit hall going on here today at the conference. And, uh, you know, showing off all of their various instruments, uh, like the Cirrus 6000. And again, we're going to be talking to Ben Turley about this instrument in just a few minutes um, as soon as he arrives. Uh, talking about the Claris Wide Field Camera. And again, if you haven't actually seen the output of this, you really should visit Zeiss's pages to take a look. It's kind of impressive. Um, you know, the pictures are kind of amazing, actually. You think about where things were 20 years ago and just how different they are now. It's remarkable. Um, and one other thing that we're going to talk about is the, uh, and, and uh, Angela mentioned it, we were talking before about CETA Faster and the HFA3. And we have a little movie here. I think I'd I like to play that for a few minutes, um, explaining what CETA Faster is and why it's useful. Um, before, you know, it might have seemed like a luxury being able to, to do these fields tests faster. I mean, it was a nice thing, right? You know, I think back to the, the before times, before the pandemic started, people would talk about, well, that would be great if I could, you know, cut down on the time it takes to do a field exam, but is it really necessary for my office? Well, I don't know. But now, of course, um, people are trying to do whatever they can to expedite people to get them through the office much more quickly. And we have a little movie here just talking about CETA faster and, and why it's useful um, and how much faster it can actually get patients through your practice. So let me turn that on for a minute here just so you can see it because um, it's, it's a good uh, you know sort of talk uh, jumping off point to talk about this as well. So and it's also got some of our favorite people in it, uh, you, people that you'll know and love, uh, clinicians that you all know in this little film. So let me pop that on for you and you can take a listen. HFA3 came out a few years ago in the obvious difference is that it had a faster processor and it had greater storage. What that allowed is certain programs and software to be run on that that couldn't be run previously. When we first started using CETA testing, sort of the general consensus was CETA standard was the test to use. It was more accurate, it was more reliable, it was more consistent from test to test. And while faster was faster, we, we were all sort of leaning towards CETA standard. One of the problems was with the old GPA, you couldn't mix and match tests. So if you started a patient on CETA standard, you really had to keep them at a CETA standard. And even as you know they were getting older and maybe it was becoming harder for them to do the test, you still couldn't make that switch. Now with the GPA on the HFA3, you can mix C to standard, C to fast, and even C to faster. And so you have a patient who maybe uh, you started on C to standard and you're reluctant to change strategies. You don't have to have that worry anymore. C to faster recently was released. It had better starting points. It wouldn't have a default of extra time added if a person didn't respond. It didn't do double a bracketing to double check points. And it was about 30% faster than C to fast. It picked up a lot of time. And it appears that in terms of the metrics, in terms of number of points flagged, the mean deviation, they were similar. C to faster is one of the new pieces of the Zeiss diagnostic puzzle on visual fields. As we all know, one of the problems with visual fields is that it's difficult for patients to maintain their attention, uh, particularly older patients. They have a difficult time in sitting behind a field machine for five, six, seven, eight minutes. 
CETA Faster has been shown to be approximately a third faster than CETA Fast and 50% faster than CETA Standard, which has been the field algorithm that we've been using for the last 20 or so years. So just by virtue of its speed, CETA Faster will add to our ability to perform visual fields and likely give us uh, better results on the field tests. So when HFA3 first came out, really the, the changes that I saw compared to the previous units were mostly in kind of workflow, so it was easier for technicians. There was the liquid lens, which reduced errors for the trial lens. There were the instructions that the technician could see right on the screen, so you're getting more uniform um, administration of the test, which is always really good. But now with the HFA3, we have CETA faster, and you know nobody likes to do visual fields. The technicians don't like to be in a dark room with a patient. The patient doesn't like to do a visual field. And so anything that we can do to make it faster for the patient, easier for the patient, we feel like we're gonna get better data. So now you can take a 24-2, and in a normal patient, do it in a minute and a half. In a patient with glaucoma, you're gonna cut your time down about 50% from CETA standard. That's just gonna make for a good day for everybody. So patients are gonna be happier, doctors are going to be happier. We don't lose any um, reliability or any um, accuracy by going to the CETA faster. We're going to have the ability through a new diagnostic, the 24-2C, which is a visual field test that has added 10 more points in the central 10 degrees. So therefore, using 24-2C, we will not have to do separate 24-2s and separate 10-2s, but we can get the same information from one test. Obviously, if we're testing 10 more points, if we run the same CETA standard, the test is going to take longer. So my anticipation is going to be that when we run 24-2C along with CETA faster, we'll be running a visual field test that will give us much more information in approximately the same time. And that's going to be incredibly important to us as we look at, again, number one, getting better visual field tests because they're faster, and or two, gathering information about the central 10 degrees of the visual field. A host of individuals, including Don Hood, have proposed that glaucoma damage occurs early in the macular region. We've been doing macular imaging testing for a while, and we can start to see if damage is occurring in that macular region. Now it's going a step further, and people have proposed doing the 10-2 test, which takes 68 points and put them in that central 10 degrees, when previously we weren't testing that area except for a few points on the 24-2. So the, the idea of the 24-2C is that it takes all the points on the 24-2 and it adds 10 points from the 10-2. So now you have 64 points, but the idea of those 10 points that right in that center 10 degrees are the ones that are thought to be the ones most commonly flagged if glaucoma develops. The idea is you have one test to run instead of two. Right now the test runs, the 24-2C runs with CETA Faster. The idea is that with the CETA Faster, it takes as long as if you're running a 24-2 with CETA Fast. So for years, we've looked just at nerve fiber layer and then 24-2 visual fields. And in the last five years or so with Don Hood's work looking at the importance of the macula in glaucoma, it's really come to light that there are some glaucoma patients who their earliest visual field defects are in the central 10 degrees. And with a 24-2 sampling uh, size, we just don't really dig down into that central 10 degrees. So what we sort of started doing was doing a 24-2 and a 10-2, which slows things down and makes it miserable for the patient. So with the 24-2C, they've incorporated five central points superiorly and five central points inferiorly, so we sort of get the best of both worlds. We don't have to do two visual field tests, but we can get the 24-2, so we're not missing any of the peripheral visual field loss, but we get some of those high, um, high importance points in the central 10 degrees. Okay, and that is 
all about CETA faster. So now you know. <laughs> and I think that brings us right up to 1130 Eastern time. And I, and I hope that Ben is here. Ben, are you with us? Always, Adam. Good morning. Uh, how are you doing? I'm very well, my friend. Very well. Excellent. Well, it's good to talk to you again. It's, it's you know, we, it seems like Groundhog Day. We keep doing this over and over again at various conferences. Yeah, it's good, though. It's, uh, it's been very uh, entertaining each time we have. And, it and it of course, is. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, I learn something new. I learn something new every single time. And it's funny because I remember um, you know, obviously, you, you know, pe people know you as being the OCT guy um, at Zeiss, but why don't you tell us what, you, what your formal job actually is? <laughs> well, well, essentially, I look after our global marketing for OCT. We have a, a huge OCT platform, as you know. Um, uh, one of the main devices, of course, uh, currently is our Cirrus 6000. So a lot of time spent um, uh, speaking, if you like, uh, uh, to, to, to various uh, uh, if you like, customers and, and our sales force, ensuring that everybody's completely au fait with the, the latest capabilities. Yep. And, you know, it, it's uh, it's funny when we yeah, I first saw the Cirrus 6000 way back when, I think I saw one of the prototypes of Vision Expo the year before, and I got to play with it and I was impressed by how fast it was. I'm like, wow, that's really great. It's It's super fast. And this was all before the pandemic. And like before it seemed like, yeah, it's great, it's fast. But now it's like, oh my gosh, it's so fast. I need this, right? <laughs> because I'm trying to get things <laughs> through. Before where it seemed like a luxury, now it's like, oh, wait, this is actually really important. Yeah, it's funny actually, you, you, you mentioned in that as you just played the video for the, the HFA3. Yeah, it's a great example of a product that there was an element of HFA that was perfect as it sat. Um, people would use it in their clinic perfectly happily. And all of a sudden, we brought out the, the Cedar Faster, and um, it was like night and day difference. And we recently had an uh, interview, if you like, with um, one of uh, uh, well-respected doctors at Cleveland Clinic, who suddenly introduced, because of the, if you like, um, COVID pandemic, suddenly introduced the actual Cedar Faster uh, element of, um, of the HFA3, and uh, would never have necessarily, in their own words, have, have gotten round to, to bringing that portion, if you like, of the device um, forward, other than because of the, the pandemic. And the same almost applies with uh, the Cirrus device. The Cirrus device is fantastic. It does what it says on the tin. It's a great device. Uh, uh, an inbuilt PC makes it extremely flexible when we use it in our um, social distancing aspects. But the key is, if you look at our legacy devices, let's go back, way back to the Cirrus 4000 device. That was a fantastic device in its day, but unfortunately technology moves on and, and these machines now are, uh, are actually slow in, in reality. If you compare them to the current Cirrus 6000 device, the Cirrus 6000 device, 270 times faster than an actual, with OCT, 43% faster with OCTA. And of course, OCTA, OCT angiography, wasn't even available for those legacy 4,000 devices. So my, my point being that, you know, today we might have a perfectly good device that does exactly what we've always wanted it to, but because of the need for efficiency right now and uh, to get our patients you know, politely in and out of the practice as quickly as possible to minimize their exposure to, to ourselves or minimize our exposure to the patient, then a Cirrus 6000 with 100,000 day scans per second really, really brings on a completely different uh, prospect to uh, the original legacy, uh, let's say, uh, Cirrus 4000 devices. Right. And for that reason, you know, uh, of course, um, we have all of our colleagues on the virtual booth, the trade booth. Uh, who can help those who have, for example, a legacy device, somebody who has an original 4,000 device and wants to move to something that is more efficient, the 6,000 device, and our colleagues are there to help, and we have some fantastic loyalty programs, uh, discounts at the moment to, uh, to assist those customers to migrate. Right. Well, let's talk about that for a second, right? Because if you have one of the original devices, right, and you're looking to upgrade, I know that most, some people, they're a little bit gun shy. They're like, oh gosh, what I have works. I don't know if I want to introduce something new into the system. How hard is it to actually 
you know, upgrade and, and move all your data over and everything else? I know that a lot of people get very worried about doing it. Yeah, that's a really good question, actually, Adam, because the reality is if you're moving from a Cirrus platform to a Cirrus platform, it's a seamless transfer. And that comes from the data as well. So not just from a, a, an acquisition, let's call it the, the, the GUI, the GUI, as we call it, the, um, the interface of the actual device. That's not going to change. You're going to have a faster acquisition, but your scan protocols and the way in which you interact with the device isn't going to change. You're simply going to be able to move your patients through the practice faster and gain, if you like, access to that diagnostic data a hell of a lot faster than your current device, simply, as I say, because technology's moved on. And that's not just Zeiss's OCT technology, that's basic PC technology processors. You know, all of that um, uh, it rides into one uh, current device that's going to be a hell of a lot faster, for example, than a 10-year-old product. And I'm pretty sure nobody watching today has a 10-year-old uh, phone on their, uh, you know, on their desk today. All right. Yeah, and so would you liken this, you know, maybe not as easy, but sort of like upgrading from one iPhone to the next, right? Where the experience is the same, similar but different, right? You're, you're, you're easily moving everything over and all of a sudden, bang, you're in this era of new performance and new functionality. Exactly. And, and the key thing is transferring that data. You know, um, I recently changed a, a phone and it used to be that I would have to download, uh, you know, my um, uh, iTunes and there are other flavors uh, to um, move my data across. And the new phone, you literally put it next to the other phone and it did it for you. Right. And it's a, a classic example of um, transitioning, if you like, from a, a Cirrus 4000 to a Cirrus 6000. One of the key things that we've done is maintain the data structure, the core data structure within the device. So as much as you might have new scan protocols, you might be capturing faster, you might have you know, other elements in that device that weren't available to you in your original, for example, 4000 device, the actual core data structure means that you can maintain that progression analysis. And the progression analysis is key because one doesn't want a new baseline today. One wants to know how that patient was when they first came to the practice and how, of course, I'm maintaining uh, you know, their condition accordingly. Right. And I have up on the screen right now, let me put it up so everyone can see it. One of the things you mentioned before was, of course, you know, the, the device itself uses some standard PC parts. I was really impressed, I actually went around the back of it and I looked. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I recognize a lot of these ports. When people want to set it up for social distancing, if I have this correctly, they can use some pretty bog standard cabling, right, that you can get off Amazon to, uh, to socially distance from patients. Yeah, I mentioned before, one of the key elements of the Cirrus platform is its inbuilt PC. And believe it or not, that is absolutely phenomenal in these current times, simply because we can utilize that technology to give us, uh, if you like, social distancing. Uh, you mentioned, for example, the, the ports on the back of the machine. If you just add a basic cable, you may even have them hanging around the office at home, um, but of course, yes, you can order them uh, uh, very simply online. But a, a simple cable would extend what is the built-in monitor to a secondary monitor. So all of a sudden you have, you know, in some cases, some devices, for example, our Claros device has a, 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 an actual capture element, and then it has a screen to view the data on. Well, we can make the Cirrus do that. And by adding, for example, in this case, a six foot cable, uh, any length of cable you, you wish, you could extend your monitor from the actual device to the other side of the room if you required. And of course, with the likes of um, wireless keyboards and mice, you can physically drive that device literally as if you were sat at the side of the device. But that's just one element. One of the most exciting elements is what say you don't want to be in that room with that patient? Maybe you don't want to even be in the practice. You can actually drive the device from another room, from another building, from another location, simply because you can remote into the actual device being a, a, an inbuilt PC. 
you can remote in and drive it. I could capture right now from my desk on a device that sits in your practice on the other side of the, well, let's face it, the other side of the world, if you wish, that would be a little extreme. Right. And the acquisition, of course, has gotten so much better that patients can pretty much do it on their own, right? It's not like the old days where it would take forever to, to actually acquire an image. Now, of course, the computer inside of it's smart enough to actually track the eye much better and, and you know, get it right very quickly. Yeah, and that's what makes the device so exciting in that it's not just 100,000 scans per second. I mean, that's phenomenal, of course, and acquisition is literally like a, a click of the finger. But the reality is that because it's so fast, you're not going to have to, for example, repeat a scan. You know, in the past, and um, with our legacy devices and, and any legacy device, the scan process may have been uh, of a speed that as the patient has, you know, micro saccades, they're going to move, it's, it's, it's human nature. It may be that you needed to go back and rescan that patient. Well, now we're capturing data cubes, dense data cubes, of, of many, many thousands, 65,000 A scans in literally 0.4 of a second. And, you know, this is this. Quick. So you're not going to get those movements. You're going to capture your data. You're going to move through the patient. You're going to be able to produce reports instantaneously and uh, effectively, as I say, move the patient through the process and potentially out of the practice uh, limiting their exposure to yourselves and vice versa. Fantastic. And, you know, we had Angelo on here before. I was asking him about supply chain and everything else. So the availability of the device, it's all good. And people, if they want to go ahead. Uh, you, you yeah, know. no problem at all. We, we had such an influx of orders when we first launched the 6000. It, it was an interesting time. We were certainly uh, paddling uh, uh, very fast to, to get everybody's units to them. Uh, now, ironically, with them, um, the instance of, uh, of the COVID uh, pandemic, it kind of leveled things out a little and no issue whatsoever. We have um, supply uh, is not a problem today, that's for sure. Uh, and as I say, with everybody now looking at their current devices, and, and I go back to the um, HF3, HFA3 uh, comments that we made earlier, it's about workflow, it's about efficiency. And the Cirrus 6000 is the performance OCT. From a throughput, does what it says on the tin, tiny little footprint, you know, of, of all the uh, devices available to you today, the Cirrus footprint, total footprint, is the smallest available, simply because everything you need is in one that, that small space, if you like, that tiny footprint. And from that point of view, You've got a device that's going to uh, give you the ability to place it anywhere you wish within the practice. You can throughput the patients as fast as you require. And of course, most importantly, a transition of data. If you're going to come from a legacy device and we have so many, so many loyal uh, Zeiss customers who are looking potentially to uh, transition into the later technology, you know, the latest technology. Moving, as we discussed, from a Cirrus platform, whether it's a 4,000, whether it's a 5,000, through to the 6,000 product is a seamless migration and will maintain all of that uh, patient data and legacy, shall we say, uh, um, uh, analysis to ensure that you're not changing your, your setup. The patient is familiar. When they sit down at that device, it looks very familiar. They're comfortable. With the, um, with the process, with the capture process. Um, and one of the things they will say, and we've had this feedback from our customers, is the comment you made, Adam, which is, whoa, <laughs> is, is that it? Yeah. That was fast. Yeah. I mean, I, when I first did it, I almost thought I didn't take the scan. I'm like, what was that? <laughs> it was yeah, to capture those, those dense data cubes we talk about. You know, these are the dense data cubes that are used in, in AI technologies now where we you know, uh, our machine processing learning of, of, of data. Um, it's not just those single lines, it's the dense data cubes that we need. And those dense data cubes are captured, as I say, in, in you know, 0.4 of a second. Yeah, it's Phenomenal. amazing. Just amazing. All right, well, Ben, I'm gonna encourage everyone to go to the exhibit hall, because I know that you have folks in there standing by um, who are willing to answer as many questions as people have. <laughs> so, you know, hopefully people will go in and fire away. Yeah, for sure. Please um, meet with our colleagues. And as I say, they can discuss those loyalty programs. 
uh, and of course, introduce new customers to, to the Zeiss platform. All right. Well, Ben, thanks for being here today. Absolute pleasure. Thanks, Adam. Okay, so that was Ben, and that was really fun. And I want to just again reiterate to folks coming on into the ex uh, exhibit hall, um, you know, check it out. There are people there who who are there and can give you all the information you need. You know, I know that it's always fun to go to Vision Expo and again play with devices like this. Like I got, I got to play with the Cirrus, you know, Vision Expo two years ago. But the reality is, if you want to get somebody's attention right now in uh, a virtual setting, it's so much easier, right? Just go on in. Uh, there are people there waiting who are product experts who can go in and help you without you having to look around for folks as well. So um, it's a really good opportunity if you just want to learn. The only thing you don't get, obviously, is you don't get the physical touch. Um, but, you know, again, this device is such an incredible output. Uh, just looking at the pictures, I think you'll be, you'll be stunned. So, so great. So I think coming up in a few minutes, uh, let's see. Let's see if our next speakers are, are here yet, our next guests on the show. Let's see. Let me pull it on up here. Got a million things going on here today, so let's see. Let's see. Oh, we do. They're here already. Wow. Oh my gosh. How punctual for once. People show up on time. So, Dr. Zalwani and Perez, how are you doing? Good. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having us. Both. So, it looks like you guys have a talk coming up. Let me pull it up on the screen for people, right? So, when was that? So, that's noon. So, that's coming up very soon, right? <laughs> Actually, we just finished. Oh, you finished? Oh, I'm sorry. That's right, 11. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm on Pacific yeah. time, so I'm always discombobulating because uh, every, everyone does things on gotcha. Eastern, so I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so how did it go? I think it went I, well. Where is it? Yeah. Sorry, I was I was muted there for a second, okay. my, uh, my naivete in technology. I think it went very well. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. So, you know, you guys are, it's funny, you know, we've had a couple of folks on here today who work as teams frequently, uh, which is usually something we don't get. Co-presenters who actually, in, in physically, in real life, like to work together, so it's kind of cool. How did you guys start, you know, get together and start working together? Well, it was uh, really a serendipitous meeting. We both did training at Bascom. Gita was there for longer than I, but I did my residency there in ocular disease. And uh, so I actually knew of her. I knew her training clearly, and I knew um, her research and her work there. And then fast forward to, gosh, I don't know, about five years later or six years later, and she appeared in the office to introduce herself as a new retinal specialist in the um, Colorado area and starting her own practice. And I'll, I'll let you take it away from there. <laughs> yeah, it, like Marissa said, it was very serendipitous. We did our overlap in our training, and about seven years ago, I was introducing myself, and Dr. Perez goes, Dr. Lawani? And I was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we, you know, I love the way the group works, and so it's been a great relationship ever since then. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So, you know, um, I, we've spoken a lot of to a lot of folks today about COVID. Obviously, it's changed everything in the way people practice. How about from a co-management perspective? What has changed for, for both of you? Go I'll ahead, let you start, Marissa. Okay. Uh, so I think to our point that we stressed within the lecture that um, it's just really important that we actually speak with each other and let each other know our findings and to arrange right now the minimal amount of essential visits so that we minimize exposure to these patients because a lot of them are auto are immunocompromised anyway. Yep. Yeah, I would agree. I think we do a lot more in um, sort of referring the patients for a complete um, exam but only when needed and we try to minimize their appointments as much as possible. Right. I know the big challenge that a lot of people have now is sort of the workflow in deciding who do I really need to actually physically see versus who I can kind of just let stay at home and I can I can manage them remotely. And I know that people are still mm -hmm. trying to work through these issues a lot of the time. Yeah, I think uh, we, we try to implement some telemedicine as far as um, communicating results. So if the patients come in, they can come in for if all they need is some ancillary testing to do OCT or visual field. And then we can, um, if they do not need clinical evaluation at that point, then we can perhaps do the consultation via telemedicine. Yeah, so unfortunately, Redmond does not lend itself great to telemedicine yet. I'm sure Zeiss is going to fix that soon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we, as most retina specialists, all of the essential patients, patients who need injections, 
Um, obviously, a lot of emergencies, you know, significant changes in vision, retinal detachment, and so forth and so forth. Right. Um, still, a very low threshold um, to not bring patients in, to be honest. But, I mean, at this point, we are fully back up to our pre COVID levels. Oh, wow. And so what kind of patients, you know, in general require sort of more co-management than others? If you had to like, you know, make a list, <laughs> you know, who are the sure. ones that always require versus, you know, those who maybe don't? So I would say the ones that have acute changes in vision, mainly because things happen so quickly. So, you know, whether it's wet macular generation, the vein occlusion, or retinal detachment, those are the patients that I think for me are most important because decisions need to be made, made rather quickly. So I think it's super helpful to have a good relationship with the referring optometrist like Dr. Perez, where she knows what I'm going to do. She's well aware of what the next steps are for the patient. She can start to give them ideas of what may or may happen very quickly. So the patient is sort of taking it in little chunks as opposed to, you know, one, you know, like in the case of the retinal attachment, they're not suddenly being told out of nowhere that they need surgery. They have an idea that this is coming. Um, and obviously, in the aftermath, you know, Dr. Perez knows what I've done, so she will know when to expect the patient to come back to her, what kind of issues the patient may or may not have at that time point, as, you know, we pointed out in one of our cases, a retinal detachment in the buckle. This patient's going to need myopic correction. This patient's likely going to need cataract evaluation as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I agree. And then I think the other case would probably be um, diabetics with uncontrolled retinopathy, proliferative retinopathy, because they tend to have a lot of comorbidities. Absolutely. And so, you know, for you know the audience today that obviously that we're all broadcasting to and talking to, it's, it's an optometric audience. And I guess if you had to give one piece of advice for co-managing retina, you know, to ODs, particularly, you know, most of the audience, they're generalists here today, right? So if you had to give one piece of advice for, for co-managing retina, what would it be? I think communication. Uh, communication goes a long way because then we understand. And communication is honestly quite difficult in this new, you know, EMR world where we're all sending out standardized letters and you know, your letter is not exactly what you need. Have, I mean, for me, a low threshold to pick up the phone and call my office or, or vice versa. I try to call people when I think it's necessary and to understand how we both do things so that we can present a united front to the patient. You know, I think we come across more um, as a team then, and I think it benefits the patient in the very end. Right. I agree. I, I would actually say if, if you don't understand your retinal specialist's um, diagnosis or something that they saw or how they came to that conclusion or their treatment, I wouldn't be afraid to actually speak to that retinal specialist. And actually, Gita is really, really good at trying at least once a year with all our busy schedules to, to get us together physically oh. and have a happy hour. And we can actually hash out some of these cases as well and new findings and new treatment technologies. So that's extremely helpful. Wow, that's really cool. That's the first I've heard of that, a happy hour. I mean, I, I think that's great. <laughs> all right, lots of good breweries out here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm down with that. That's awesome. All right. Well, great. Well, guys, thank you so much for doing this today. And thank you for your talk. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people got a lot out of it. And I, and I hope you got some good questions as well. So, again, thank you for doing this. Yeah. Thanks thank for you for having us. us. All right. Yeah. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Okay. So that was pretty neat. And uh, now I learned something, right? That the, the best way to co-management co-manage is with beer. Clearly, right? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, who you know, being out here in Portland, I, I can't say we're too far different from uh, from that either. You know, sort of a very informal culture out here, and I think it it serves us well a lot of the time. Um, okay, so we're coming up on uh, twelve o'clock Eastern time very soon. But before we do, uh, let me just um, you know take a look at what's going on here at the the, uh, the next schedule. So. Uh, the value of integrated diagnostic solutions, and so with Steve Demko, so that should be a really interesting one uh, on the practice management side, and practical approach to the glaucoma suspect. So again, uh, another really interesting topic, this one much more clinical, and we're going to be speaking to Drs. Lal and, and uh, Epstein later as well, so pretty cool stuff. And if I haven't hit it yet, I just want to sort of um, show folks, you know, one thing that uh, we, we saw um, during this whole era of COVID is that people are doing whatever they can to try to social distance. And one of the coolest things that I saw early on was, 
there was a practice who actually took their instruments and <laughs> their whole pretest area and rolled it outside into their parking lot. I kid you not. Um, and so patients can sit in their cars, roll up to the pretest area, and get most of the exam <laughs> done that way. And I actually have video footage of it, and I think you'd find it really interesting. Um, obviously, with, with Zeiss's instruments, you know, they facilitate the sort of social distancing and, and remoting. So you should check this out. This is pretty neat. The funny part about it, of course, is I look at that as I cringe a little bit because I, I see, you know, this really high-tech expensive equipment coming out on carts, but everything, everything works fine. You don't have to worry about anything fall over. But just check out this video. It's pretty cool. Hi, it's Christine with Bold Vision. We are so excited to begin offering curbside drive-through exams for our patients. I'm just gonna walk you through the process really quick. As you can see, I am wearing a mask. Due to current CDC recommendations, we ask that if possible, you wear a paper or cloth mask when you arrive for the drive-through, just to ensure yours and our staff's protection. So let's pull through the process. Hello. I'm Barbara. I'm a receptionist with Volt Vision. This is the station where I would check to see if you've called ahead and given us your information and insurance and just move ahead to the next station. Okay, thanks Barbara. You're welcome. All right, so we're going to pull through our drive through area. Hello. Hi, Christine. Okay, well, I'm Deanne. I'm one of the other technicians here at Volt Vision. At this first station, what I'm going to be doing is just collecting some medical history from you, uh, any visual complaints, problems that are bringing you in to see us today. Once we've got your chart complete, I'll have you pull forward where you're going to be meeting with some of our other technicians curbside to get a vision and some other tests. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. you. <clears throat> so we pull forward and we're just going to step out of the vehicle. It's only to the curb. There are no other patients present. And if we have a patient who needs assistance, the team will be happy to assist them exiting the vehicle and, um, and crossing over to the curbside. All of our technicians have masks and gloves on and sanitize each and every surface in between all of our patients. your vision that way okay great okay fantastic and then you'll step on over here I will take this instrument right here and then we'll check your eye pressure with this instrument right here okay, everything is sanitary we will be wiping everything down and we also have of course hand sanitizer <laughs> everything is sterile perfect all right our last step is we're gonna take a fundus photo it's very simple chin and forehead in there this just lets our doctor review the health of the back of the eye, rolls out any diseases. Um, it's equivalent to being dilated, so they get a good view. And that's Wonderful. it. Perfect. So at this point, I would get back in my vehicle, and one of our doctors will call, text, or telemedicine my results. And that's it. It's as easy and simple and safe as that. Thanks so much. We'll hope to see you soon. Okay, now, you know, as you can see, that was a, a pretty unusual uh, way to practice, but it works for them and it allows them to have a great deal of uh, patient throughput. So pretty cool stuff. Um, I, I think you, you might have been cringing along with me, like having the equipment out on the carts, but obviously nothing disastrous happened. Um, and again, this probably won't work too well depending on where you are as winter approaches, but for the summer, this has been an ideal solution for many folks. Um, so it was kind of cool to see how creative people are getting. Um, to try to find ways to socially uh, distant from their patients. So I thought that was pretty neat stuff. Um, and again, coming up uh, right now in the uh, 12 o'clock hour. So we have two lectures coming up. Now in terms of the, the practical approach of the glaucoma suspect, we're going to be speaking to these two docs later in the day, and I'm really curious to hear how it goes and, and what they had on tap for that lecture as well. One of the, the interesting parts about doing this live stream is that I can't actually see the lectures because <laughs> it's trapped in here. Um, but I usually go back and I get to watch them later. Uh, so, yeah, oh well, you know, it's uh, one, of the, one of the downsides of being, being in here. Um, 
And so let me just quickly review again what everyone needs to know about. So um, if you, you know, remember only one thing today from participating in this live stream is that there's this page med support now that Zeiss has set up, which is uh, a collection of the, all of their resources sort of put into one place. So Zeiss has been really aggressive since the pandemic started about pooling together all of their resources for doctors, for creating a huge amount of educational content, uh, and for helping you with things that you need to know uh, going forward. You know, how to optimize your exams, to, to improve patient throughput, how to sterilize your equipment. Uh, they've been providing breath shields, and again, we're gonna to talk to one of the folks behind that program uh, in a few minutes and learn all about it as well, since this has obviously become very important to everyone. Um, going forward, I would imagine, of course, that breath shields are going to become standard equipment on, on most instruments. Uh, but obviously, there is a huge need right now to retrofit everybody's instruments out there because for the, you know, most people don't have anything like breath shields or didn't before this uh, pandemic. Um, so again, uh, the, the Met Support Now page is where you want to go to learn about all of this stuff. Um, and again, we've been talking about some of the instruments as well. There's an exhibit hall attached to the conference today. So if you're, you know, if you're in between lectures or you don't want to listen to me ramble on anymore, what you can do is go into the exhibit hall and actually learn all about these different products. And there are product specialists there in the exhibit hall that you can chat with. Um, so if you want to learn more, they're there to, to help. It's a very easy way to interact with folks who know more about these products than anybody. Um, so pretty cool stuff. And... I ran a video before uh, all about HFA and CETA faster, uh, and I'll play it again in a little bit as well, you know, for people who might be popping in and out of the stream because it was a really interesting talk about why CETA faster has become so important. Um, and we just had Ben Turley on before talking about the, the latest Cirrus machines and how much faster they are versus the original ones. Um, and how when, you know, there's always been this push for increasing speed and it has always been seen as a nice to have but suddenly it's become a very important thing to have and, and almost necessary in some cases. If you can cut down you know, on the time it takes to do an, an OCT scan or cut down on the time it takes to do fields, um, you can really push that many more patients through, uh, which is important now, right, as you're trying to keep everyone as distant from each other as possible. Um, so I'll play that HFA3 uh, and CETA faster video again, just so you can understand the context of, of why CETA faster is so important these days. Uh, one other thing that we're going to be talking about as well is the forum software. Um, so this is Zeiss's uh, software solution that ties together all the data that these devices output. And in fact, it actually takes data from a wide variety of hardware, not just Zeiss's stuff, um, to give you sort of an overview of what's happening in a, in a comprehensive way instead of getting your information in drips and drabs. So again, the idea is that this can improve your throughput in your practice, right? You can see the information in a, a coherent and fast way. Um, so you can work faster and better. And we'll be talking to the folks behind Forum as well very soon, probably in the next half hour, I think. Um, so that should be really interesting. And it should be a lot of fun to do. And so one other thing that I'd like to pull up just for a moment. Don't want to give it short shrift because, you know, it is a pretty neat, neat thing. You know, slit lamps, uh, <laughs> something everyone needs. Um, and you think, well, slit lamps, I mean, it's 2020 now. These things have been around for I don't even know how long, right? 100 years or whatever. Um, you know, what could you possibly be doing different? And so Zeiss has actually come out with this new, new slit lamp, the SL800, which has a lot of new, really interesting features, including an LED light source, which is very new, um, as well as some ergonomic enhancements as well, just to make it easier to use. So if you take a look at some of the optics, it's kind of incredible. Uh, the, w the way things have progressed. And we're going to be talking to the, uh, to the folks uh, who manage this as well um, so we can learn a little bit more about the SL800. So pretty cool stuff. And that will be coming up very soon. Okay, so while we're here, why don't I play that see to faster thing again for you just so you can see it one more time. Um, cause I had, uh, you know, I'd, I'd always of course heard about CETA faster and why it was important, but now of course it's become even more important. And especially as, as, um, the population is aging as well, 
it gets more and more difficult for patients to do these field exams. So anything you can do to make them faster and easier is a good thing, uh, but especially in the age of social distancing. So why don't we, uh, I'll play that one more time for you guys right now, uh, and then we'll go on to our next interview. So here we go. HFA3 came out a few years ago, and the obvious difference is that it had a faster processor and it had greater storage. What that allowed is certain programs and software to be run on that that couldn't be run previously. When we first started using CETA testing, sort of the general consensus was CETA standard was the test to use. It was more accurate, it was more reliable, it was more consistent from test to test. And while faster was faster, we, we were all sort of leaning towards CETA standard. One of the problems was with the old GPA, you couldn't mix and match tests. So if you started a patient on CETA standard, you really had to keep them at a CETA standard. And even as you know they were getting older and maybe it was becoming harder for them to do the test, you still couldn't make that switch. Now with the GPA on the HFA3, you can mix C to standard, C to fast, and even C to faster. And so you have a patient who maybe uh, you started on C to standard and you're reluctant to change strategies. You don't have to have that worry anymore. C to faster recently was released. It had better starting points. It wouldn't have a default of extra time added if a person didn't respond. It didn't do double a bracketing to double check points. And it was about 30% faster than C to fast. It picked up a lot of time. And it appears that in terms of the metrics, in terms of number of points flagged, the mean deviation, they were similar. C to faster is one of the new pieces of the Zeiss diagnostic puzzle on visual fields. As we all know, one of the problems with visual fields is that it's difficult for patients to maintain their attention, uh, particularly older patients. They have a difficult time in sitting behind a field machine for five, six, seven, eight minutes. CETA Faster has been shown to be approximately a third faster than CETA Fast and 50% faster than CETA Standard, which has been the field algorithm that we've been using for the last 20 or so years. So just by virtue of its speed, CETA Faster will add to our ability to perform visual fields and likely give us uh, better results on the field tests. So when HFA3 first came out, really the, the changes that I saw compared to the previous units were mostly in kind of workflow, so it was easier for technicians. There was the liquid lens, which reduced errors for the trial lens. There were the instructions that the technician could see right on the screen, so you're getting more uniform um, administration of the test, which is always really good. But now with the HFA3, we have CETA faster, and you know nobody likes to do visual fields. The technicians don't like to be in a dark room with a patient. The patient doesn't like to do a visual field. And so anything that we can do to make it faster for the patient, easier for the patient, we feel like we're gonna get better data. So now you can take a 24-2, and in a normal patient, do it in a minute and a half. In a patient with glaucoma, you're gonna cut your time down about 50% from CETA standard. That's just gonna make for a good day for everybody. So patients are gonna be happier, Doctors are going to be happier. We don't lose any um, reliability or any um, accuracy by going to the CETA faster. We're going to have the ability through a new diagnostic, the 24-2C, which is a visual field test that has added 10 more points in the central 10 degrees. So therefore, using 24-2C, we will not have to do separate 24-2s and separate 10-2s, but we can get the same information from one test. Obviously, if we're testing 10 more points, if we run the same C to standard, the test is going to take longer. So my anticipation is going to be that when we run 24-2C along with C to faster, we'll be running a visual field test that will give us much more information in approximately the same time. And that's going to be incredibly important to us as we look at, again, number one, getting better visual field tests because they're faster, and or two, gathering information about the central 10 degrees of the visual field. A host of individuals, including Don Hood, have proposed that glaucoma damage occurs early in the macular region. We've been doing macular imaging testing for a while, and we can start to see if damage is occurring in that macular region. 
Now it's going a step further and people have proposed doing the 10-2 test, which takes 68 points and put them in that central 10 degrees when previously we weren't testing that area except for a few points on the 24-2. So the, the idea of the 24-2C is that it takes all the points on the 24-2 and it adds 10 points from the 10-2. So now you have 64 points, but the idea of those 10 points that right in that center 10 degrees are the ones that are thought to be the ones most commonly flagged if glaucoma develops. The idea is you have one test to run instead of two. Right now, the test runs, the 24-2C runs with CETA faster. The idea is that with the CETA faster, it takes as long as if you're running a 24-2 with CETA fast. So for years, we've looked just at nerve fiber layer and then 24-2 visual fields. And in the last five years or so with Don Hood's work looking at the importance of the macula in glaucoma, it's really come to light that there are some glaucoma patients who their earliest visual field defects are in the central 10 degrees. And with a 24-2 sampling uh, size, we just don't really dig down into that central 10 degrees. So what we sort of started doing was doing a 24-2 and a 10-2, which slows things down and makes it miserable for the patient. So with the 24-2C, they've incorporated five central points superiorly and five central points inferiorly. So we sort of get the best of both worlds. We don't have to do two visual field tests, but we can get the 24-2, so we're not missing any of the peripheral visual field loss, but we get some of those high, um, high importance points in the central 10 degrees. Alrighty, so, and as you can see, that was the CETA faster. So now you learned all about why it's important. And um, so pretty interesting film with some of the folks that we, we know and love. Um, so uh, coming up now, and I think he's here, we have an interview with Zach talking all about breath shields. So let's see. So Zach, are you there? Hello, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you. How's it going, Zach? Great, how are you? I am doing great. So, uh, you know, we've been talking today all about social distancing. It's been the topic du jour. Um, yeah. And I guess, you know, you're, you're one of the guys who's, uh, you know, here to talk to us all about the program that you set up way back when, right? I remember, I guess it was back in February or March. Um, yeah, right at the all, beginning of the pandemic. It was right in the beginning. You guys really jumped in and, and tried to help out by offering these breath shields. You want to tell everyone a little bit about the program and how you got started? Yeah. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, we made a huge effort to go ahead and reach out to all the doctors that were using our instruments and see, you know, how their needs were going to change as a result and, you know, how they were adapting to move forward. So from that, the biggest thing we walked away from was that all the, you know, exam lanes, front desk areas were going to be modified to be more conducive to social distancing. The most common thing was that plexiglass was being installed at the front desk and in exam lanes. 
So we thought it's just a logical next step to do something similar for the instruments. So from that, we started designing the breast shields with the goal of creating, you know, a clear physical barrier that sticks right onto the instrument that also maintains a normal, comfortable use of the instrument. So you don't really have to have a comfort, compromise in ergonomics or patient comfort. It just is plug and play and you're ready to go. Great. Yeah, and actually I have up on the screen right now, I'm sure you can see it, the, uh, the, the shield on a Claris unit. Uh, yeah. the, the big question I think people have is, you know, um, can, can I put these on all my instruments? What instruments is this for and, and how does it all work? Yeah, so right now we have breast shields available for Cirrus, Claris, HFA3, HFA2, Atlas, uh, Cirrus Photo, Visucam, Matrix, FTT, and then we have one coming soon for Plex Elite. So definitely a wide variety of instruments covered under that umbrella. So should typically be able to order the breast shields. Right. And so, of course, you know, before the pandemic, this was not really even heard of. In fact, I'm trying to think if I ever saw such a thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, it's it's not something that people even really thought about. I mean, you, you see like sneeze shields right at a buffet. <laughs> exactly. And that's about <laughs> it. But now all of a sudden, like it's everywhere. You know, any, yeah. any place you visit, should you dare venture outside of your house? You see these things everywhere, right? In, in supermarkets, you know, no matter where you go, this has become such a common thing. So it's amazing that you guys jumped on so quickly and got these things engineered and out the door. Yeah, believe it or not, one of the hardest parts of it was actually sourcing the plexiglass because it's in such high demand globally that, you know, you just got to really find a vendor who can accommodate the need. Right, I'm sure. I'm sure it was really challenging. So going forward, though, like if, if someone orders a new unit, does it come with these things pre-installed? Uh, so you have the option to purchase these as an optional accessory with your instrument. So we don't want to be shipping out breast shields people don't want, but we want to make sure that everyone has the chance to get it when they order the new instrument. Um, so they can be ordered both online at a web shop or through your local sales representative. Um, so depending on if you already have the instrument or if you're purchasing the instrument, we make it really easy to get the breast shield. Right, and actually I have up the, the page right now, if you go to the, the Med Support Now page, uh, it's very easy to actually get to the, the, the page where you order uh, the shields. In terms of installation, I'm looking, you know, again, I have the Claris up here as an example. If, yeah. if you know, you deliver these shields to someone, how easy is this thing to install? Is it a challenge or is it pretty straightforward even if someone's not too handy? Yeah, so the breast shields were designed for the first priority of being user installable. So we made sure to keep the installation as simple as possible. Um, we actually created several installation videos where you will see that you actually just need an Allen key for the bolts. Uh, no drilling is needed because the shield is held on by this industrial strength adhesive called dual lock. It actually allows the shield to be removable. So should you periodically need to deep clean the shield, you can just take it off and then stick it back on for up to a thousand times without any loss in strength. Um, and it shouldn't take any one person more than 15 minutes to install it. It's super simple to do. Excellent. And it is plexiglass. So are there any special cleaning instructions for it or is it pretty straightforward? No, nope, just go to all 70% isopropyl alcohol and a soft cloth and you're good to go. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, I'm zooming in here. So again, people can see it, that this will not be a big deal to install. I know, I know everyone gets yeah. nervous. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely, at first I was like, oh, this is going to be hard, but then once I tried it out and recorded the videos, which fun fact I do star in, you know, <laughs> uh, it was super simple, very straightforward. So happy with how that came out. Excellent. So again, so they can just go to your webpage and, and order it, or if they know their rep, they can reach out to the rep and, and order it that way as well. That's correct. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So anything, you know, you also mentioned drapes. I have to, since I have you here, why not? So um, talk to me a little bit about the drapes too for the Zeiss instruments. What, what, what does that look like? So the drapes are these little plastic covers that go along the high contact surfaces of the instrument. So you just lay those down and it creates just a simple little, you know, kind of covering that's removable between patients. So it's just a simple piece of plastic, sticks on, designed not to damage the instrument. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And again, we, you can order it right from the same page? Correct. Cool. All right. Well, well, Zach, thanks for this. I mean, I think, you know, this is one of those things that people don't really think about until you're, you're in the moment and now you need it. So I'm glad that you guys are doing this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. Well, again, so if anyone, you know, sort of needs help, they can just go to the Med Support Now page, click through, and then they can get right to your eShop and order it. So that, Zach, thanks so much for, for being here today. Perfect. Thank you. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.
Alrighty, so those are the shields. So again, you know, I'd, I highly recommend folks if you want to go on out to the, the web shop and order them, it's, you know, could not be easier. Um, just click buy online, choose your region. And there you go. And you can securely order them that way. So pretty neat. Yeah, it's funny actually. I don't know if people thought, you know, even 10 years ago, if this is something that would be a thing where the instrument manufacturers actually had up their own e-commerce portals that you could easily order from. Uh, you know, it seems, it's, it would, would have seemed, you know, sort of fanciful 20 years ago even like, that you'd order high-tech equipment like this that you could do it through their website. But it is here, the future is now. So pretty cool stuff. And I will remind people, if they're here listening to me, perhaps they should be into the lectures as well. It's actually now 12.20, um, so we're kind of in the thick of two talks right now. Uh, the value of integrated diagnostic solutions and practical approach to the glaucoma suspect. And we're going to be talking to Drs. Lull and Epstein very soon, as soon as our lecture is done, actually. We'll see how that, that went. Um, so pretty neat stuff. And again, I will remind you, if you're just tuning in now, as so many people are popping in and out of here today, um, if you go to the Med Support Now page, and that is this, if you get nothing else out of my rambling today, this is one of the most important pages you can go to uh, from the conference because it's sort of the, the portal where Zeiss has put up all of their materials um, that they're creating and have created throughout the pandemic, helping you adapt to this sort of new normal. Um, you know, in, including things like uh, education and product resources. Um, so you can sort of see down here the different resources that they have, talking about social distancing exams, how to disinfect the devices, the coverings that they have. Again, this is where you can go to order the breath shields. So this is definitely the place where you want to go. Uh, and as Zach just told us, you can actually order breath shields for the full line of instruments here. Um, so it isn't, you know, just for the Claris. I had the Claris up there for illustrative purposes before because it was on their site, but you can actually get these shields uh, for a wide variety of these devices and, it's, you know, not brain surgery to install. Um, just about anybody can do it, so you don't have to be nervous that you're going to hurt anything. And probably a good idea to do, uh, you know, if you have one of these instruments uh, sort of before the whole pandemic broke out, you should probably order you know, order these things, they're, they're a really good thing to have. And as we're seeing just about every organization, anytime you're getting people that go face to face with one another within a couple of feet, you're starting to see these plexiglass barriers going up everywhere. Um, you know, whether it's the supermarket or the DMV or wherever else, you know, these things are becoming the absolute standard. Uh, and I think patients will appreciate seeing you having these things up because there are a few things that you do where you're closer to patients than in a typical eye exam, like, like sitting at a salute lamp. Um, so definitely go check it out. And also, if you're at the show today, you probably also want to check out the exhibit hall. I know I've harped on it before, um, but you know, you'll get a really good sense of what uh, Zeiss has to offer for their different instruments. And in fact, I have a couple of movies, I haven't even played them yet about the Claris 500 and the Cirrus 6000. Maybe I should show you guys those as well, just to give you a sense of, of the instruments and, and what they're like. But if you go into the booth, you'll get much more detailed information about each, uh, as well as the specials that are going on today. I, I don't want to underplay that. You know, if you're participating in the conference today, Zeiss is offering a large number of specials and you need to go in and talk to your reps about them. Um, so definitely do it. But I can play the little video so you can actually get a sense of what the Claris 500 and the Cirrus 6000 are like. Uh, why don't I do that now? Well, we have a minute before our, our next interview starts. So here we go. Here's the Claris 500 talking uh, about the technology behind the machine.
And, you know, the thing that I find so um, remarkable about the Claris, besides obviously the image quality, which is tremendous, and the fact that it's in full color, is the footprint, the footprint of the device. If you actually look at it, and I think you, you might have been able to glean it a little bit in the video there, this thing is tiny relative to the old school wide field cameras. You know, you remember when the, the first ones came out, you know, these things were gigantic. I mean, they almost had that, that you know, they almost look like a telephone booth. I mean, in terms of their size, they had a huge footprint. Uh, the internals of these things, if you open them up, just the, the, the mirrors that were inside them and the, the mechanical complexity, it was truly shocking. And to see something like this uh, that takes superior images and is just so small is just really sort of amazing. It's the, the leap in technology over the past decade has really been shocking. Um, to me, that, that's one of the, the biggest things that I noticed is the industrial design has gotten so much better. Um, and it's just, you know, you look at this thing and the amount of space it takes up, it's just shockingly small relative to the old devices. So that, that is the Claris. And I also have a little thing about the Cirrus 6000. So again, we interviewed Ben Turley before talking about the device and just how much faster it is than the old one. But take a look here. And so the remarkable thing to me, again, besides the speed, you know, as Ben mentioned, is that you can easily upgrade from an older device to the new one, sort of like you would with your iPhone, right? Where you're not going to lose all of your old data and it'll just go straight over. So you're not going to be really learning anything new. All of a sudden, though, you're just going to be unlocking higher performance and new functionality, of course, because there's OCTA uh, in the device as well. So uh, it's a very sort of easy migration uh, and especially important if you're doing serial exams and so forth, you wanna have that consistency, right? Uh, and you want the data to look the same and, and make it easy to access. And in a few minutes, actually, we're gonna have uh, Mike Toronto coming on with us talking to us about forum software, which is sort of Zeiss's, as they call it, a secret weapon. Um, you know, that it's the software that organizes all of this data that the devices uh, spit out. Um, in a way that you can easily understand the output and get patients through faster. So we're going to have Mike on here in a few minutes, uh, and let's see if he's here already. Let's uh, let's see, Mike, are you there? I am here. Wow, no. right on time. Awesome. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Oh, going well. We're having a good time here today, talking about everything, and the crowd's been good, and it's it's been a lot of fun. So yeah, we're having yes. a great time. Um, but, you know, we're, we're here today with you to talk to, to everybody about the secret weapon, as they've been calling it, <laughs> right? Uh, talking a little bit about Forum. So why don't you just, you know, give us a little bit of your background and, and maybe then we can launch into talking about what Forum is. 
Yeah, so um, my name is Mike Toronto. I'm the manager of uh, U.S. Digital Sales. I've been at Zeiss for 10 years. Um, I really am responsible for our uh, digital product uh, portfolio, uh, forum, the workplaces, and veracity, and uh, selling that into um, uh, all the uh, channels. Um, so I, I've been here at Zeiss for 10 years. I've been in the ophthalmic, uh, ophthalmology and uh, optometry space for about 20 years. I started out uh, as an OCTN geographer and uh, technician and, and doing all of those types of things uh, at a university hospital and then moved over into industry. So, um, and my, my wife's an optometrist. Uh, so some of you may have a familiar last, no, notice a familiar last name. So uh, she's, she's in the field as well. So we, we're all eyes all the time in my household. Indeed. So you actually talk shop after hours, huh? <laughs> yeah, it gets old, but we, we do sometimes. <laughs> so let me actually bring it up on the screen so people can see what we were talking about here today was Forum. Yeah. Um, and so some people don't even know what Forum is actually, right? Because it sits in the background for a lot of people. It's not like having, you know, like a Cirrus sitting out there. Um, so they may not be familiar with it. You want to just take us through a little bit about what it's all about? Yeah, so, so really um, uh, what I like to say is forum starts uh, really with your EMR and your practice management system. So we receive the patient demographics of the EMR. We send them out to the connected devices. Uh, by the way, that's both Zeiss and non-Zeiss devices. So the whole idea would be that the uh, staff never uh, anymore type in a patient name or misspell anything or um, type in a wrong patient ID. It all comes system. Uh, and then um, the studies are performed, the testing is performed, and the uh, imaging results go back to forum. So you have a very specialized uh, viewer. Uh, not only do we, we store the results, like the reports that you might be used to um, from, from your, uh, your devices that are static, like PDFs or JPEGs, uh, but for many of the devices, we store um, a manipulatable data. So for uh, OCT, to scroll through the OCTs and run uh, GPA analyses in the workplaces, um, you can do all of that directly in forum. Um, uh, we even have you know, modules that show um, visual fields, optic nerve head OCT, ganglion cell OCT, and fundus photos, uh, all with one click uh, on a patient's uh, timeline in glaucoma workplace. So uh, you have access to all of the data not just a static report. So you can, as a physician, you can change baselines, you can exclude a study, include a study, um, you can uh, really manipulate the data to help tell the story um, uh, that you need to tell either the patient or to help you make a diagnosis. So it's, uh, it's a pretty powerful tool um, and it's multimodal. So it brings multiple devices together. Right, very cool stuff. And you know, you're in kind of a unique position, right? With, with your role at Zeiss, because you get to sort of oversee all of digital. So you get to see how people have been adopting these technologies. And I'm wondering, what's it looked like since before COVID? And now that we're kind of in the thick of it, have you seen sort of a ramp up of people adopting this? Do people pause? What have people been doing? How have they been working with the software? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we've, we've, uh, before COVID, I mean, our business was strong and robust. I mean, we probably have the, you know, the top image management data management platform on the market uh, here at Zeiss. Um, and again, we connect Zeiss devices, non-Zeiss devices. So, so really we have everything from a small single doctor clinic all the way up to a university hospital or VA uh, that deploy for them. So we have a, a really robust digital business um, uh, already. Um, and then since COVID, it's been really interesting uh, where, where some of the, the hardware sales and things like that, as you can imagine, kind of slowed down a little bit. Um, they've definitely started picking back up in the last few months. Um, we saw a, a huge uh, uptick in request for digital uh, software platforms. Uh, you can obviously imagine uh, clinics are, are trying to uh, work remotely, provide the doctors access with data outside of the exam lanes. They don't want the doctor walking over to a Cirrus and, and running through uh, you know, a patient's data on the device. Um, so we've actually been, uh, my team has been completely um, working from home since uh, basically early March and, and uh, we've been nonstop busy. So it's, it's, uh, it's been really interesting to see the, the digital strategies of uh, ever, everyone evolve. Uh, even at Zeiss, we, we, you know, we evolved, we moved from a in-person workforce in our Dublin call center to, you know, everyone working remotely and remoting in and, you know, support phone lines switching over. And I think we did that in 48 hours. Um, and uh, it's just amazing the uh, growth that we've seen in the last few months. Wow. And 
I'm kind of wondering, you know, if let's say you already have the devices in place, you have an office full of hardware, and as you say, you don't want people running back and forth anymore with reports. If someone wanted to implement something like Forum, what does that actually look like these days, right? Because you're not going into office nece offices necessarily, right? Where does the software live? How does it all work? Yeah, yeah. So, so even uh, even that's changed for us. We we were really heavy um, uh, on-site deployment, um, and we couldn't really uh, do that anymore for a few months. So we converted our teams to doing a lot more remote. We worked on our remote deployment processes and uh, really got those dialed in. Um, we can still offer on-site if that's preferred by the practice. And as you can imagine, changing a clinical workflow is, uh, you know, it's not it's not uh, always, uh, you know, 100% smooth. There's little bumps and, and you've, you've got to work through those. And each each clinic's uh, workflow is, set, is, uh, is very customized. So we, um, we've definitely improved uh, and built on those processes. And um, uh, the system lives on a server in your office. So um, uh, we are exploring uh, cloud options that will be coming uh, probably in the not too distant future. Um, but uh, right now it's all uh, in clinic office based. So it's very fast and efficient, you know, over your local network uh, uh, is not gonna rely on a network connection to the outside world uh, to access your data. Um, those things. So right now, um, you know, that's kind of the footprint. We deploy on a server in the office. Uh, depending on the size of the clinic, uh, we can supply that hardware uh, as part of our forum office uh, offering, which is a specific bundle that includes a, a mini server. Uh, or if the clinic already has a server, we just deploy on their hardware. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty easy to do remotely. Uh, we connect the devices and uh, deploy that uh, for the practice and, and we can now we now can do that 100% um, remote if that's required by the clinic or any combination of, of uh, remote and on site. Right. So you can essentially just drop a machine in and then you can access it remotely to help get everything set up for them. Right. As long as they can Correct. access the Internet, then you're in, in good shape. Yeah, and our forum office system comes pre-configured, so it's got all the software loaded. It's got all the licenses uh, for the devices and and uh, and feature sets for forum. Uh, so it's all pre-loaded. You put it on your network. Give us remote access. That's pretty cool. And you know, one thing that yeah. I was thinking about too. You mentioned that it is obviously in office server based. It ha it almost has to be with the amount of data that people are pushing, right? I mean, it would be very difficult to do it all cloud based. Yeah, yeah. So, so there, there are ways to do it cloud-based. It, it will usually require even uh, some type of on-site appliance, whether it's like a mini computer that's communicating with the with the cloud. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it, it's it's tons of data. It's 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 lots of data. It also, um, if you have a Cirrus and a visual field and a Claris, um, it, Forum actually acts as the backup for those devices as well. So the there's you know data redundancy built into those uh, mini servers that we we pr we provide. Um, so you know you don't have to back up the device anymore every week or remember to back it up. It's basically backed up instantly after you uh, take the take the test. So it's it's pretty uh, pretty cool product. Wow, very cool. Yeah, I never really even thought about that or considered the backup aspect of it as well. So that, that's pretty neat. Um, so what do you, you actually think going forward? Like if you had to put on your crystal ball like five or 10 years out, where do you see all of this going with Forum and, and with digital in general? Yeah, so I mean, as we saw in the last five, six months, um, we've jumped ahead probably three or four years in digital adoption. We're doing a, a virtual conference right now, which is pretty cool. I'm, from my house, and uh, and I'm sure you are as well, or from your from your nice office space uh, there. Um, but uh, but you know that's that's really the driving force. I think digital is only going to become a more important product portfolio for Zeiss. Um, outside of uh, optometry, we offer digital solutions for um, uh, cataract uh, refractive surgical planning uh, through both Forum, and EQ Workplace, and our Veracity platforms. So we're constantly expanding the digital footprint out. Uh, we offer, um, uh, we can connect our surgical microscopes to, to these technologies, to Forum and Veracity. So doctors get, you know, heads up display in the, in the OR with uh, data overlays like a fighter jet. Um, so it's uh, it's really cool technology. Um, and I think, you know, the, Zeiss is always at the forefront, right? So when you think of future state of medical technologies, artificial intelligence, those type of things, you know, Zeiss is always going to be pushing the forefront. Um, and with our new leadership under Ewan Thompson, who comes from a digital background, um, I, I think the future is amazingly bright here at Zeiss for digital technologies. So if somebody wants to get started with Forum, where do they begin? How, how do, like, you know, they know they want yeah. to do it. Do they just go into the exhibit hall right now and reach out to you guys? How do they get started with it? Yeah, so, so my team is, uh, is manning the booth there, um, and uh, we're, we're happy to speak with you there. Or if you reach out to your local Zeiss sales manager, they'll put you in touch with 
with one of my teammates uh, on the digital team. Uh, we'll work work with you on that promo on that uh, proposal. All right, yeah. very cool. Well, well, Mike, thanks for this. I'm, I'm sure you know we're going to be keeping close tabs on you over the next several months because I think you're right. This is only going to accelerate. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's growing quick, and uh, and we're happy to help uh, people make their workflows more efficient. So. All right, great. Well, <laughs> thanks for being here. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate it. All right, so that was Mike and Forum. So pretty cool stuff. Um, you know, I like the idea. People always talk about the cloud as if it's sort of a a foregone conclusion that that's the the way things are always going to go. But having servers on premises can actually still be quite useful, particularly if you're pushing a huge amount of data. And as you've seen from the the output of many devices, you know these we're not talking about small files. A lot of these things can be very big. Um, so having that sort of mixed setup where you have a local machine that may be interacting with the cloud, maybe perhaps even uploading some data offsite uh, as backups as well, perhaps that is a, a more appropriate solution for a lot of uh, offices that are pushing a great amount of data. Um, you know, what was, what was it, the, the old famous quote, that never underestimate the bandwidth of a, of a station wagon with a, you know, a, a trunk full of tapes hurtling down the highway. And it's true, right? When you're pushing a massive amount of data, having physical storage locally makes a great deal of sense. Um, and then, you know, offloading it somewhere else, to, you know, to the internet perhaps uh, as a remote backup also makes sense as well. But just having that, that local presence can really help with performance. So pretty cool stuff. And it is interesting that they'll pre-configure a machine for you and actually just deliver it so you could plop it right down and get started, connect it to the internet, and then have them remotely manage it to get it going. So. So neat stuff. And we have just a few minutes here, I think before our next interview, we have about five minutes. So let me take this aside here and show people what's going on in the world around us. And we have one more lecture coming up today. So we're just about finishing up with the, the noon lectures and then there's gonna be one more the medically minded practice. We interviewed uh, Drs. Ramsey and Fulmer before. They are obviously very passionate about medical optometry, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, and they're going to give you really good advice about how to get your medical practice going. Uh, so they're definitely people to listen to. Even if you only you know, can implement a few of the pearls that they give you, it's worthwhile, uh, since they are definitely all in. As we heard, Dr. Fulmer is actually creating a brand new practice right now. Uh, with medical being its sole focus, so pretty neat stuff. Uh, and on the clinical education track, we have an OCT interpretation from anterior to posterior. Again, OCT interpretation, when at least from an OD wire and C wire perspective, when we put on these performances, OCT interpretation is almost always at the tops of the list of things that people want to watch. People are very obviously hungry to learn more about OCT interpretation. Uh, so I have a feeling that this lecture is going to be a good one. Um, and I think we're actually going to be speaking uh, with the folks who are giving it as well uh, today at 1.30 Eastern time. So that should be really neat too, getting their perspective. And so in just a few minutes, we'll be talking to uh, the uh, next folks to, that we have interviews with. And in the interim though, let me pull up on the screen right now one more time so people can see it the med support now page i know i keep harping on it but this is an important one so this is the one place where zeiss has pulled together all of their resources for you uh, to sort of navigate the new normal their educational materials are here they talk about how to disinfect your devices they talk about best practices for social distancing uh, if you want to order um, those drapes and the breath shields that we that we were speaking to zach about a few moments ago, this is the place where you can do it. Uh, they have this portal online where you can quickly and easily order it. So it's nice moving into the e-commerce age uh, so you can get these things in a hurry. And again, if you need to install the shield yourself, it's a very simple operation. It looks like anybody can do it. Uh, even if you're not handy, it's a you know 15 minute operation. So definitely check it out. And I think we have one more minute, and I don't know if our next folks are here yet. Let me see. Hey, Adam. How are you? Ah, Dan, you're here. How's it going? I'm good. How have you been? I am doing well, and I think we're waiting for a new. I don't know. Oh, there he is. Oh, there we go. Hey, how's it going? Hello. Ah, how are you both doing today? 
Hanging in. Yeah, hanging in there, definitely. Ready for the weekend. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. So you guys, uh, you know, you have a lecture, right? So um, let me pull it on up here so people can actually see the title of it again. And mm -hmm. so pull it on down here so we can see. So a practical approach to the glaucoma suspect. So emphasis on practical, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So before before we launch into what your talk was about, maybe you guys could just introduce yourselves and, and tell everyone, you know, what what your practices look like and, and you know, a little background on yourselves. Yeah, sure. So my name is Dan Epstein. I work in Manhattan at Mount Sinai Morningside. So basically right in the middle of the city. And it's a hospital based ophthalmology practice. So we do get a lot of disease, a lot of glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy. And you know, it's nice to have all the tools available. So we do have OCT, visual fields, photography, all fluorescence, because without those, it's really going to be tough to manage these cases. Right. Um, Anu? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so my name is Anu Lal. I'm an associate uh, clinical professor at the uh, SUNY College of Optometry. Uh, so, uh, you know, things that I do, of course, uh, you know, I... Uh, teach in some of the ocular disease uh, classes and laboratories. Uh, I run the glaucoma micro credential program. It's a new program that we have at SUNY where uh, students get extra experience uh, in the glaucoma clinic. And then, of course, uh, you know, I'm an attending in the glaucoma service as well, uh, working with fourth year students and residents. Great. Okay. So, you know, in your lecture, you, you hit on a very fundamental issue right in the beginning. <laughs> you sort of talk about, you know, when do you start treating glaucoma? How do you know the patient even has it, right, versus something else? How aggressive do you get? And that's a really, it's a fundamental question, right? Do you have glaucoma or not? Um, and how do you guys approach that? So I think for me, the big thing is you want to check for correlation between your clinical exam, when you're checking fundoscopy, your OCT, your visual field, um, you know, of course, checking IOP and things like that, that if it doesn't really fit the pattern of glaucoma, you always have to ask yourself, is this a different type of optic neuropathy? And if you have mild defects, a lot of times you can monitor these patients because you're not afraid they're going to go blind within a month or two. If it is an optic neuropathy, then maybe they will go blind in a month or two, but that's not going to be from glaucoma at least. So you do have to sort of triage your way through that sometimes winding road, which might be a little bit tough in some patients. But the, the technology nowadays things helped a lot especially with a ganglion cell analysis now that you, I really find really different types of patterns in glaucoma versus neuroptomic disease. That's helped me a lot in those types of patients. Right. Yeah, I, I to totally, totally agree. I think, you know, it, you know, glaucoma presents in a certain way. Uh, so, you know, if you start seeing defects, let's say on a uh, you know, temporal area of a strictly temporal area uh, of the uh, OCT and a severe loss in the ganglion cell complex, yet the nerve fiber layer still looks okay. You know, it's likely not glaucoma. You know, glaucoma has these typical wedge type defects. Uh, you'll have this, you know, wiper defect on the uh, uh, ganglion cell analysis. And visual fields are so, so helpful. Uh, just looking, looking at patterns. Um, so, yeah, you know, if you're getting a nasal loss, you know, okay, you're thinking more of glaucoma, but if you're getting a temporal loss, you know, that, that likely isn't glaucoma on your visual field. So, you know, just look, look for something else. Right. And, you know, uh, I knew in your lecture, you mentioned that you, you go to gonioscopy first, right? This is yeah. always like your, your go-to. How come? What's, what's, why do you do it that way? Uh, oh, I mean, that, that's a great question. So when it comes to uh, diagnosing glaucoma, you know, although primary open angle glaucoma is the most common and it's the bulk uh, of what I see, uh, you have to convince yourself, you have to ensure yourself that, you know, we're not missing a secondary glaucoma. Uh, for example, pseudo exfoliative glaucoma, um, because your treatment could be very different. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, pseudo exfoliative glaucoma is more aggressive as compared to primary open angle glaucoma. So that being said, if you didn't do gonioscopy, if you didn't check uh, the angle, or if you didn't see if there was pigment there or not, uh, you know, then you may miss uh, glaucoma. And pseudo exfoliation and pigmentary glaucoma are, are types of glaucomas that are often missed uh, for folks because, uh, again, they, they could be subtle unless you go ahead and do gonioscopy. Right. And, you know, also in your lecture, you guys harp heavily on visual fields, right? This seems to be a, a favorite thing that you mm -hmm. talk about. And I'm bringing it up right here. You know, I've, I've shown people videos over and over again today. Actually, Rich Madonna was in this particular one as well. 
Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, a bunch, a bunch of big New York connections here, I guess. That's um, it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just talking about the importance of fields and, you know, they're talking about CETA faster as well. And I, th I was wondering if maybe you guys could give a little background about why this is so important now, uh, even more so now that COVID has hit, you know, about CETA faster. Well, sure. I mean, Dan, I think, you know, you, uh, you uh, uh, use the, the CETA faster quite a bit and the 24-2C quite a bit. Yeah, so I've been using it exclusively 24-2C with CETA faster. That's the only visual field I run for my glaucoma patients. And, you know, you bring up a good point in the COVID era, you want patients sort of in and out, you don't want them hanging around. And with CETA faster, the visual fields are definitely much quicker. And for me personally, like we spoke about, I do like to get a lot of visual fields, especially in the first two years. So I might get, you know, four, five, six visual fields. So if I get them quicker, not only is it great for, you know, uh, you have more time to disinfect the room, you have more time to, with the patient instead of the patient being testing, but you can also get more patients into that room per day. So it helps just workflow seeing patients because, you know, for about two, two three months, we were sort of shut down completely. I was seeing maybe two, three patients a week. So now we have this whole backlog of not only glaucoma patients, which 100% have to be seen, but also glaucoma suspects, which, you know, they're a little bit less urgent, but some of those patients are going to be true glaucoma patients. So it's great to get the 24-2C mm -hmm. FASA, which gives us a lot of great information very quickly, but it's still valid information. You know, we're not really losing reliability much in those types of fields. Right. Yeah. And you, you mentioned, you know, airflow is another big thing. So if you're, you know, doing a shorter, uh, you know, visual field, uh, you know, you're, you're less time that a patient is breathing, uh, you know, in, into the device and, and, and into the room as well. Uh, I do want to bring up a sort of a, a quick point is that, um, you know, the another advantage right now of, of uh, you know, the Humphrey visual fields is that you can actually uh, analyze your visual field, your guided progression analysis using mixed visual fields. So as we talked about sort of in the lecture that you can use, you know, if you have uh, 10 years worth of 20 24-2s, um, you know, standards, and now you have uh, the 24-2C or the FASTERS, you can implement those into your guided progression analysis. Uh, and we know from some of the, the studies that, uh, that from Crab, you know, he looked at visual fields over time. And if you, uh, you know, take visual fields, you know, many visual fields over time, those variabilities do tend to, uh, you know, decrease between uh, see the standard versus a, a see the faster or faster. So that being said, you're really, as Dan mentioned, you're really not losing a lot of data, uh, you know, in, in these faster protocols. Right. And I know that was a big concern, right? That initially, right. oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to throw mm. all this data out that I've collected over all these years, but that is just not the case, right? Correct. Exactly. Yep. Excellent. So, you know, you also mentioned in your lectures that OCT has become sort of a, a, a big component as well. How, how are you guys utilizing OCT in your practices? So and OCT for me, you know, I get a image of the nerve and the macula because of course we want our RNFL measurements, but we also want our macular ganglion cell analysis measurements. Um, you know, if a patient has only defects in the ganglion cell analysis, I don't know if that's enough to convince me someone has glaucoma. But the way I use it very often is making sure that it correlates with my RNFL OCT and also with my visual field. So if all those three correlate, then I'm pretty happy that this patient definitely has glaucoma and I'm much more confident. If something doesn't make sense, then I, I might take a step back and think, oh, maybe it's a different type of optic neuropathy. So I think it's just like another sort of checks and balance point that helps us out. Sure. And, and I think the other thing to, to consider as well is that, as we mentioned in the lecture, when it comes to, you know, even you have the, you know, the smallest suspicion that this patient may have glaucoma, I think it's absolutely worthwhile to get that OCT testing because as, as the lecture showed, longitudinal data is so helpful. And, and in, the, in the patient that I had in the lecture, as you can see that, um, you know, their nerve fiber thickness was still within a normal, uh, within the normative database. So it was still within a normal range. However, you can see after 10 years that their visual, their, their um, you know, nerve fibrillar thickness uh, decreased in that 10 year uh, portion. So, uh, you know, getting that, that data early and following patients over time, uh, it, it's so useful uh, in terms of glaucoma management. Right. And in, and in terms of data too, one thing that I find really interesting about all this, when I think back to 30 years ago or whatever, when I was in school, 
none of this, I mean, you had some field data, right? But the sheer volume of data that is being generated by these high-tech devices now is, is almost overwhelming. When you think about what it was like before for the older practitioners <laughs> to now, I mean, it's yeah. just mind blowing. It's completely different. And, you know, we, we were just uh, talking to Mike at Zeiss about, about Forum and being able to sort of wrap your arms around all the data that, that's being generated. So how do you guys actually handle it, particularly with glaucoma, right? This has to be the most data driven and data intensive part of optometry. Sure. I mean, Forum, I think, is 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 great. Uh, so as you saw from, uh, from the lecture, uh, I tend to use Forum a lot. And, and it really helps sort of pierce that data, you know, kind of piece it together. Uh, so within one screen, you can actually see, uh, you know, let's say uh, the VFI values of the visual field. You can see the average RNFL thicknesses uh, via T-SNIT or n -STIN curve. Uh, and you can actually break it down uh, versus, uh, you know, let's say I want to, you know, analyze the superior aspect of uh, the, the RNFL, and it will give you slopes on the superior aspects, it will give you, uh, yep, VFI values on the on the inferior aspects and on the hemifield tests. So it really packages this, uh, uh, you know, data in a really nice way so that within a quick glance, you can actually look for trends. And I think that's, that's imperative. Right. Yeah, I think that's all great points. You know, we just have so much data and we're going to get more and more of it, you know, because when now that OCT has been around for years and it's been really adopted to a lot of optometrists now, just think about how much data we're going to have in the next 10, 20 years. And especially if we're going to start using maybe OCT and geography scans more for glaucoma and optic nerve disease. So that's just so many different scans to look at. And you know, if you're just glancing at numbers or you're glancing at the RNFL deviation map, sometimes you might miss progression analysis or you might think that something's progressing when it's actually just variability inherent within the data. And, you know, those packages, the GPA packages, the progression analysis packages that come with form and come with the Zeiss series OCT, that's really going to help us look at the data in a little more detail and just makes it a little bit easier. You know, right. But I don't think anything beats the glaucoma workplace where you have 10 years of data, visual field, VFI, OCT, deviation map, all in one. It just makes it so easy. I mean, it's, it's amazing to think how much used to be missed, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. 30 years yeah. ago, it's yeah. like, uh, exactly. um, so it's, it's amazing the tools that we have at our disposal now that we just didn't have before. So it's a... You know, it's, it's kind of, a, a, for glaucoma at least, this is kind of, I guess, you know, the, the, if you're going to have it, this is the time, right? <laughs> you know, it's, it's going to it. more. I mm -hmm. mean, yep. and I guess the other question is, you know, um, one big discussion that we've had today is when you actually need to see patients, right? Because there's a lot of triage going on right now deciding, does this patient actually need to be seen in my office or can I keep them away longer? What are you guys seeing in your practice about the way you're triaging patients, having them come in versus keeping them, you know, sort of away and out of the clinic? So with me, it, it's a hard decision because especially being in a hospital, being in Manhattan, you know, Anu is also, he's a senior optometry in Manhattan. So we're really, we were in the center of the pandemic in the USA, but now things have sort of quieted down. So I'm actually trying to see patients a little bit more often now in case we do have a double hump later on. Mm. So now we have this like period where, you know, we all sort of feel kind of safe. We can see patients. So some of my glaucoma patients, I didn't see them for maybe five, six months where I would see them every three months. So now I might see them in a two month period, get more testing done quickly than I would usually just in case, you know, once October rolls around flu season over starts up again that we might not be seeing each other again. So at least this way I have the data necessary to make sure, oh, look, you know, you're stable. If I don't see you for six months, okay, we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that I that I'd probably add to that is that, you know, you're absolutely right. When it comes to the practice of, uh, you know, glaucoma or just practice of, uh, of, of optometry ophthalmology in general uh, is that, you know, this move to a, a telehealth or telemedicine type approach. Uh, and, and there are some awesome things that are happening uh, in regards to home visual fields. There are some, uh, you know, things like using um, VR goggles for visual fields. There's going to be some home tonometers coming out in, in, in the future, I'm sure in the next uh, few years, and even imaging as in taking photographs using your, your iPhone. So, you know, it's very exciting what's going to happen uh, in the next, you know, year, two years, five years, and 10 years. Uh, however, 
the way I practice right now is that, you know, I use uh, things like forum to look at the slopes of my patients. And that's how I judge when I need to see this patient back. Because if a patient has a relatively flat slope, uh, that, that is, that's not a downward slope, then I may be able to spread out my, vi uh, my visits a little bit and see those patients who need to be seen sooner. Uh, just as, as Dan mentioned, uh, hopefully we, we, we don't get a huge second, second wave uh, of COVID, but if, if that's the case, uh, you know, I, I triage my patients by looking at the data and, and uh, you know, prioritizing those patients that need to be seen. Right. Well, guys, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed for both of you that you don't get that second wave um, and that everything hopefully by next year starts to get back to a little bit more normal. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks thank so much you. for doing this today. Great thank chatting. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. So always good to talk to practitioners out in the field and it's particularly ones from New York. You know, that's where I was born and raised actually at Mount Sinai was where I was born. So I have a particular affinity to it. And it's uh, sort of sad to see what happened there with COVID. But, uh, you know, we'll keep our fingers crossed that they don't get that second bump uh, in the future before a vaccine is available. So that's about it. So we're coming up on one o'clock right now. And this would be the uh, last lectures of the day. Um, again, medically minded practice uh, with Drs. Ramsey and Fulmer. We spoke with them earlier, very passionate about medical optometry. You definitely want to check out that talk. They're a lot of fun. Um, and it seems like they, they, they routinely team up. So uh, they work, work together well as a team. So that'll be a fun one to watch. And again, OCT interpretation from anterior to posterior as well. We're going to be speaking uh, to Darren and Jennifer very soon as well. So that sounds great. So for right now, it is again one o'clock and I want to review one more time everything that's happening here. Let me pull on up the med support page. So again, if there's anything that you don't want to forget today, med support now, you want to go to that page. Uh, this is ICE's one-stop shop for where they keep all of their information um, since the pandemic about how to adapt to the new normal, including things about their instruments, how to clean them, where you can get breath shields, best practices for social distancing as well. Um, so, you know, as your workflow changes, this is a really good resource to actually check it out. Uh, one thing, by the way, <clears throat> if you're looking to do remote exams, remote-ish or social, socially distanced exams, let me pull up the Cirrus one again. Part of the cool uh, thing about a lot of Zeiss's equipment is that for instance, with the Cirrus, they use a lot of standard uh, PC connections with the device itself. So I don't have a picture of it here. Let's see if I can find one. Um, where the cables, oh, maybe they don't have it here, the actual cables that you need to remotely distance yourself from other people to actually perform the exam across the room, those are standard PC cables um, that you can you know, get from Amazon or wherever else. Um, so it's not proprietary at all. So you can quickly and easily set up a device like this so you can do the exam from across the room or from across the country if need be, um, which is pretty neat stuff. And so that is the Cirrus. And again, we've been talking about all the different Zeiss products here today as well. If you go to the exhibit hall, uh, Zeiss is offering deals today for people who attend the conference. So go log into the conference Click log in and you'll get in uh, and then go to their exhibit hall and you can check out their product booths and see what they're all doing uh, as well. And you can talk to the product specialist and see what kind of discounts you can get or even bundle packages. Uh, interesting talking to, to Mike, the, the overlord of the forum software, right? So he handles all of their digital uh, products and talking about how even in the time where people weren't buying too many new devices, you know, at the, the big teeth of the pandemic was going on, people were, were, you know, implementing a lot of the software like forum software to try to make what they have more efficient, which I find really fascinating. Um, that even during this downtime where perhaps people weren't as busy as they might have liked, they were doing things to still enhance the workflow in the office, like implementing forum. So definitely check that out as well in the exhibit hall. It's more, I can't really do it justice here showing you what the software looks like um, and the, the retina workplace or the glaucoma workplace. Um, really impressive stuff to help you track patients through time. 
And as Mike mentioned, it also provides a backup for your devices, which I didn't even really think about because it's an additional server that sits in your office and it draws the data from all the devices that you have so it can act as, a, as another backup so you don't have to continuously back up each individual device. So it sort of centralizes all of that for you, which is pretty cool. So I want to show a couple of highlights here uh, while I'm here. And, you know, we have these, these little movies for you to see. Um, a couple of really fun ones. So the first one that I wanted to show you was uh, this drive through thing. I showed it a little while ago, but if you're just joining the live stream. Um, so people have been getting creative about how to socially distance their patients from one another. And so one practice took it upon themselves to actually move their pretest area outside, literally outside into the parking lot. Um, so they, patients could sit in their cars, drive up, do the exam, get back in their car and go. And so they don't have people stacked on top of each other like cordwood in the, in the uh, waiting room. Uh, it's a really great idea for social distancing if you can get away with it, if the weather is good enough where you are. And of course, during the summer, it's been, I don't know how well this is going to go in the winter in a lot of places, but we'll see. But anyway, I thought you might find the video really cute. Uh, so check out what this practice did. And again, try not to cringe. I was a little bit nervous when I started watching it about putting this high-tech equipment on these carts and bringing it outside, but nothing fell over, so it was all good. So check it out. Hi, it's Christine with Bold Vision. We are so excited to begin offering curbside drive-through exams for our patients. I'm just gonna walk you through the process really quick. As you can see, I am wearing a mask. Due to current CDC recommendations, we ask that if possible, you wear a paper or cloth mask when you arrive for the drive-through, just to ensure yours and our staff's protection. So let's pull through the process. Hello. I'm Barbara, I'm a receptionist with Bold Vision. This is the station where I would check to see if you've called ahead and given us your information and insurance and just move ahead to the next station. Okay, thanks Barbara. You're welcome. All right, so we're gonna pull through our drive-through area. Hello. Hi, Christine. Okay, well, I'm Deanne. I'm one of the other technicians here at Bold Vision. At this first station, what I'm going to be doing is just collecting some medical history from you, uh, any visual complaints, problems that are bringing you in to see us today. Once we've got your chart complete, I'll have you pull forward where you're going to be meeting with some of our other technicians curbside to get a vision and some other tests. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. you. <clears throat> So we pull forward and we're just going to step out of the vehicle. It's only to the curb. There are no other patients present. And if we have a patient who needs assistance, the team will be happy to assist them exiting the vehicle and, um, and crossing over to the curbside. All of our technicians have masks and gloves on and sanitize each and every surface in between all of our patients. Look at the letters you're going to tell me what you can read and i'll check your vision that way okay great okay fantastic and then you'll step on over here i will take this instrument right here and then we'll check your eye pressure with this instrument right here right, everything is sanitary we will be wiping everything down and we also have of course hand sanitizer <laughs> everything is sterile perfect all right, our last step is we're going to take a fundus photo. It's very simple, chin and forehead in there. This just lets our doctor review the health of the back of the eye, rules out any diseases. Um, it's equivalent to being dilated, so they get a good view. And that's Wonderful. it. Perfect. So at this point, I would get back in my vehicle, and one of our doctors will call, text, or telemedicine my results. And that's it. It's as easy and simple and safe as that. Thanks so much. We'll hope to see you soon. Pretty nifty, huh? And so uh, I thought that was really cool. And, you know, I don't know what other people or other practices are doing around the country. That's the first one I've seen in a parking lot. Um, but before we get on to our, our next interview here, what I'd really love to do again is play for you one more time. Um, you know, we just had a really long discussion about CETA Faster. Uh, you know, we've heard, we've heard about it and that you can actually use it and you can mix CETA Faster, uh, you know, with, with the standard test as well. And I don't think many people are aware of this where they feel like they couldn't, they have to throw out all their old data. I just want to run, run this piece one more time because it is important so people can understand, especially in the age of social distancing, when you want people to get in and out of your office quickly, 
uh, these field exams, which can take, you know, it feels like forever. If you can actually use a faster protocol for social distancing purposes, it's probably worthwhile. So I just want to play this one more time so, so you can see it uh, and, and really start to understand it. So here we go. HFA3 came out a few years ago, and the obvious difference is that it had a faster processor and it had greater storage. What that allowed is certain programs and software to be run on that that couldn't be run previously. When we first started using CETA testing, sort of the general consensus was CETA standard was the test to use. It was more accurate, it was more reliable, it was more consistent from test to test. And while faster was faster, we, we were all sort of leaning towards CETA standard. One of the problems was with the old GPA, you couldn't mix and match tests. So if you started a patient on CETA standard, you really had to keep them at a CETA standard. And even as you know they were getting older and maybe it was becoming harder for them to do the test, you still couldn't make that switch. Now with the GPA on the HFA3, you can mix C to standard, C to fast, and even C to faster. And so you have a patient who maybe uh, you started on C to standard and you're reluctant to change strategies. You don't have to have that worry anymore. C to faster recently was released. It had better starting points. It wouldn't have a default of extra time added if a person didn't respond. It didn't do double a bracketing to double check points. And it was about 30% faster than C to fast. It picked up a lot of time. And it appears that in terms of the metrics, in terms of number of points flagged, the mean deviation, they were similar. C to faster is one of the new pieces of the Zeiss diagnostic puzzle on visual fields. As we all know, one of the problems with visual fields is that it's difficult for patients to maintain their attention, uh, particularly older patients. They have a difficult time in sitting behind a field machine for five, six, seven, eight minutes. CETA Faster has been shown to be approximately a third faster than CETA Fast and 50% faster than CETA Standard, which has been the field algorithm that we've been using for the last 20 or so years. So just by virtue of its speed, CETA Faster will add to our ability to perform visual fields and likely give us uh, better results on the field tests. So when HFA3 first came out, really the, the changes that I saw compared to the previous units were mostly in kind of workflow, so it was easier for technicians. There was the liquid lens, which reduced errors for the trial lens. There were the instructions that the technician could see right on the screen, so you're getting more uniform um, administration of the test, which is always really good. But now with the HFA3, we have CETA faster, and you know nobody likes to do visual fields. The technicians don't like to be in a dark room with a patient. The patient doesn't like to do a visual field. And so anything that we can do to make it faster for the patient, easier for the patient, we feel like we're gonna get better data. So now you can take a 24-2, and in a normal patient, do it in a minute and a half. In a patient with glaucoma, you're gonna cut your time down about 50% from CETA standard. That's just gonna make for a good day for everybody. So patients are gonna be happier, doctors are going to be happier. We don't lose any um, reliability or any um, accuracy by going to the CETA faster. We're going to have the ability through a new diagnostic, the 24-2C, which is a visual field test that has added 10 more points in the central 10 degrees. So therefore, using 24-2C, we will not have to do separate 24-2s and separate 10-2s, but we can get the same information from one test. Obviously, if we're testing 10 more points, if we run the same C to standard, the test is going to take longer. So my anticipation is going to be that when we run 24-2C along with C to faster, we'll be running a visual field test that will give us much more information in approximately the same time. And that's gonna be incredibly important to us as we look at, again, number one, getting better visual field tests because they're faster, and or two, gathering information about the central 10 degrees of the visual field. A host of individuals including Don Hood, have proposed that glaucoma damage occurs early in the macular region. We've been doing macular imaging testing for a while, and we can start to see if damage is occurring in that macular region. 
Now it's going a step further and people have proposed doing the 10-2 test, which takes 68 points and put them in that central 10 degrees when previously we weren't testing that area except for a few points on the 24-2. So the, the idea of the 24-2C is that it takes all the points on the 24-2 and it adds 10 points from the 10-2. So now you have 64 points, but the idea of those 10 points that right in that center 10 degrees are the ones that are thought to be the ones most commonly flagged if glaucoma develops. The idea is you have one test to run instead of two. Right now, the test runs, the 24-2C runs with CETA faster. The idea is that with the CETA faster, it takes as long as if you're running a 24-2 with CETA fast. So for years, we've looked just at nerve fiber layer and then 24-2 visual fields. And in the last five years or so with Don Hood's work looking at the importance of the macula in glaucoma, it's really come to light that there are some glaucoma patients who their earliest visual field defects are in the central 10 degrees. And with a 24-2 sampling uh, size, we just don't really dig down into that central 10 degrees. So what we sort of started doing was doing a 24-2 and a 10-2, which slows things down and makes it miserable for the patient. So with the 24-2C, they've incorporated five central points superiorly and five central points inferiorly. So we sort of get the best of both worlds. We don't have to do two visual field tests, but we can get the 24-2, so we're not missing any of the peripheral visual field loss, but we get some of those high, um, high importance points in the central 10 degrees. And okay, so now you know all about CETA faster, and uh, and and I think we have Austin on the line here. Our next interviewee is right on time, punctual as always. How's it going, Austin? <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you, Dr. Farkas? I am doing great. We're having a fun time here this morning. You know, we're, the conference has been going really well. The lectures have been great, and uh, it's it's nice to have you stop in here and and you know. And, and stop by. I know we were on the phone yesterday, going back and forth prepping for this. So it's gone as 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 well as you can imagine. So thumbs up. Yeah. I well, and, and great to hear. Uh, great to hear the studio is up and running. I I saw the pictures you were showing earlier. It did seem like quite an ordeal. So oh, yeah, it was. It has been crazy here. But yeah, no, we we were able to get it back together under the gun. So I'm, I'm, I'm really there happy about go. that. So you yeah. know, Austin, maybe you could talk us through a little bit about what it is that that you do at Zeiss, so people can get to know you a little better. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm a global uh, marketing manager um, on our uh, ophthalmic diagnostics team. So uh, I actually kind of play a couple of different roles where I support some products um, a little bit more extensively. So uh, slit lamps, which I'll talk a little bit in a, in a minute, um, our routine diagnostics portfolio, uh, as well as some of our therapeutic lasers. Um, uh, but then I also do a lot of work just kind of across the portfolio, particularly uh, here in the U.S. and particularly for the optometric market. So uh, I've been really involved with uh, helping plan this uh, particular event, uh, as well as the one that we did back in uh, in March. And, uh, you know, it's 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 a lot of a lot of pulling different things together, but it's been a lot of fun. You know, we've got a great group of doctors that we've been able to work with, um, not only for this event, but in previous events. and. Um, so yeah, so I so I kind of get to dabble in, in in a lot of different things. So always keeps me on my toes. Well, kudos to you because I know this is a lot of work putting all this together, <laughs> and it's just the, the the sheer volume of stuff that you guys have put together since the pandemic started is just remarkable. I don't know how you did it. I, uh, <laughs> it it definitely is a lot. I, I think it's one of the uh, the neat things about being at a place like Zeiss, where you know. You know, I think company leaders always talk about wanting to be there and support their customers, but uh, I feel like our leadership team has really uh, kind of embodied that mission. Uh, I know Angelo was on earlier and, um, you know, they've been really just kind of clear figuring out what can we do to support, how can we really partner, not, you know, not only right away after the, you know, kind of pandemic, uh, you know, got, got off, but, um you know, even today, you know, six, seven months into this thing and, and how we're kind of continuing to roll with punches. So 
uh, I think it's more of a testament to, to Zeiss and just kind of the company culture that we have. Right. Well, well kudos to you because it's been great. Thanks. And uh, Thanks. You know, it's funny, we've been talking a lot today about very high tech devices, right? You know, I put it mm -hmm. up on the screen over and over again. We had, you know, like the Cirrus and the Claris and all this other, you know, super high tech stuff. But the reality is Zeiss, you know, did, didn't you guys get your start in slit lamps? Wasn't that your thing? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, the slit lamp was one of the very first uh, devices that um, that Carl Zeiss uh, introduced, and um, you know, it's actually yeah, a lot of people will tend to think of Zeiss for you know the Claris and the Cirrus and the, you know the HFA, which you, you know everybody loves the HFA. Um, you know, it's been around for you know I think like thirty years. Uh, but, you know, we really, one of the unique things about Zeiss, again, you know, we've been around for 170 plus years, you know, we've got just a, a truly end-to-end -end portfolio from, you know, the time a patient comes in for the very first time just to, you know, uh, get a, you know, routine exam for glasses or for contacts or, you know, just for that very first kind of initial um, visit with a doctor, uh, all the way to, you know, cataract and refractive surgery, you know, Zeiss uh, really does kind of have that entire portfolio. And, um, you know, I think that's one of the things that that makes me and, and the folks I work with just so kind of passionate about, you know, uh, you know, working in a place like Zeiss and work and, and, and our products, because, you know, we really do have something to treat and to assist and really kind of be there for, for every patient. And, um, you know, whether that's, you know, somebody that's, you know, directly close to me or close to somebody that I know, or, you know, somebody I've never met, um, knowing that, you know, our systems can, can really provide, uh, you know, value and, and make sure that people are getting the kind of best uh, eye care quality that, that they can get, so. Right. And, you know, people might not think of slit lamps as being, you know, high tech, but they are. Um, up, up on the screen right now, you'll see the latest, the SL800. So maybe you can talk us through it a little bit just so, you know, you can see. I mean, obviously, slit lamps have been around forever, uh, but they've evolved just like everything else. Yeah, no, 100%. I, um, this is one of my favorite products to, to show in front of customers. And, and my favorite thing to always say is, you know, when you think about slit lamps, you don't really kind of think about, you know, how are you going to innovate it? How, how is it going to, you know, how is it going to be better than before? Um, you know, it's easy to think of certain things like, you know, cameras and, and, uh, and our phones and how are, you know, how are those, you know, pieces of technology continuing to advance, but, you know, slit lamp, you kind of scratch your head a little bit, but um, with the SL 800, our team really did a, a terrific job. Uh, you know, bringing kind of that that next wave of innovation to to you know piece of um, equipment that's used you know on every single patient. You know, it's probably the most touched piece of equipment in in most every practice. So, um, and there's really kind of three things about the innovation and in, in the SL800. So, um, the illumination option. So. Uh, all slit lamps either have an LED uh, based illumination or a halogen based illumination. Um, no slit lamp actually can really combine the two, uh, you know, benefits um, like the SL800. So it is an LED slit lamp, but there's actually a filter that allows you to kind of mimic um, uh, basically the illumination principles that you get from a halogen uh, light source. And that's really beneficial if you're looking at the posterior segment. So you want to, um, you know, want to look at the fundus, it's going to give you more kind of a natural impression. Um, whereas the LED is really good for uh, anything anterior segment. So, so being able to kind of balance those two is, is really important. And then there's, you know, advanced ergonomics that the team built in. So there's an electronic quick stop break that, you know, instead of having to manually kind of fumble with getting the slit lamp locked into place once you got your um, kind of positioning right, just a quick tap and it's locked. Um, and then even an automated magnification changer. So you're not having to, again, kind of fumble with just, you know, quick, uh, you know, quick flick of a few buttons and, and it's just automatically um, you know, we'll, we'll move the magnification up and down. Uh, but I think honestly, the, the, the biggest thing that, uh, I think our team just, you know, hit it out of the park with, with the development of this product is the optical quality. And, you know, 
Bates has always been known for optical quality, but, and it's one of those things that, you know, on brochures and on websites, you know, at some level it can be a little hard to show. I know you got some pictures up right now. I mean, you just see how crystal clear some of those images are, you know, even at the highest magnifications. And, and that really makes a big difference for clinicians to, you know, notice things that they, you know, wouldn't have noticed before. So, um, so it's really uh, impactful to be able to, to kind of have that optical quality. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm trying to, trying to show people trying to zoom in here. I don't know if it's yeah. doing a good job, but yeah, yeah, it's difficult to show in person. So pretty, yeah. pretty neat. So, you know, wh what's the feedback been since, since we've, we've last, you know, spoke, it's been a while since we spoke yeah. and I think I'm kind of curious as, as people are getting yeah. these devices. Yeah. I, it, again, I think the biggest thing that we're hearing, I mean, people love the, uh, I think, you know, people were always curious when they uh, heard about the, you know, the quick stop and the auto magnification changer. Obviously, you know, with the current, you know, environment, we haven't been able to, you know, bring it out to show. So people haven't been able to, to kind of get their hands on it. But when they've gotten their hands on it and the customers that have bought and that have implemented, you know, they love the, the illumination and the ergonomics. But again, the optical quality is what, what makes a, a big difference. I, I know at the uh, the, the cataract and refractive surgery, um, you know, virtual event that uh, we hosted back in, uh, I think, end of April. Um, Dr. Paul Singh, who, uh, who has one in his office right now, uh, was, you know, just talking about just how brilliant that optical quality is. I mean, he's just, and and he's actually come done a, a few different events and um, uh, on, on different Zeiss kind of platforms. Uh, he did an Instagram live uh, deal with us a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was just kind of walking around his practice showing different uh, devices. And, and that was one of the things that he pulled up. He was just like, that's all he under. He goes, the optical quality on this thing is just unreal. So um, it's one of those things, uh, you know, I encourage people, you know, reach out to your reps, get a demo. We'll be happy to send one in and, uh, you know, really kind of see for yourself, um, you know, the quality that uh, that our development team uh, kind of produced. Very cool. And you know, I, I mentioned before, you know, high tech is what this day has been about. Well, you know, you guys have come out with a camera, right? So I know that for slit lamps, you know, people have been trying all kinds of wacky solutions to actually take pictures. Yeah. You know, I mean, down to like using duct tape, right, with their iPhone to try to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no. So you have a real solution. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we uh, we just launched a couple months back. Uh, an integrated camera that will work uh, not only with the SL800 but uh, with all of our um, uh, slit lamps. So, uh, yeah, it's an it's an integrated um, 18 megapixel camera. So, uh, really high uh, quality uh, uh, pictures that you're going to be able to get. Again, you know, especially when it's attached to something like the SL800, just that uh, optical quality is just going to be really sharp. Um, you know, we got up to about 40 frames per second um, with uh, with what we call live view. So, you know, that's really allowing you to see on the screen, you know, really what you're seeing in real time looking through the oculars. You know, you're not getting delay on that video. So, you know, that's really important for patient education or other doctor education, other consultations. So, um, you know, really high quality with the videos. And then, you know, from a software perspective, we've really kind of taken the uh, our game to another level where, you know, there's very customizable reporting um, that, you know, the image capture and video capture is super simple. You know, you can actually capture um, images while you're taking video. So you don't have to try to switch them back and forth between the modalities. You start a video and then you can, um, you know, just take images throughout that video. So really, um, you know, kind of optimizing your workflow, which, you know, right now we know is super critical. Uh, given just the need to kind of keep patients moving through the practice and then, you know, tying it in with forum, which, uh, you know, we, I know you talked a little bit about uh, Mike earlier. I you know people joke and call it the, the best kept secret at Zeiss sometimes, you know, it really uh, to, to bring all that diagnostic data together, uh, you know, and to integrate, you know, the images and the videos from the slow lamp um, to tie that in with everything else is just really impactful. And, and again, you know, with the current environment is just, uh, it's just even 
you know, so much more impactful to, to have all of that one location where, um, however you're connecting with the patient, whether it's, you know, video conferencing like this, or, you know, a call, um, leveraging, you know, any kind of telemedicine platform, uh, to have all of that in one location and, and be able to kind of quickly review and, and, you know, provide the you know best possible kind of treatment and, um, you know, diagnosis for your patients. Right. So, so we're really excited about what we uh, what we have with the new camera. Yeah, I'm curious about the camera. Is it available yet? Can people order it or no? Uh, yes, yes, it is. Uh, it is available to order. Um, uh, yeah, if, if uh, you know, we've got a booth in the uh, in the exhibit hall for the SL800, um, and our reps would be more than happy to talk to people too uh, about getting them. Um, uh, the camera that goes with it. All right. Very cool. All right. Well, Austin, thanks for all this today. And thanks for setting all this up. I mean, I know it's just been a tremendous amount of work, but, uh, you know, I think it's paid off. I think people have had a really great time here today. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Again, you know, it, it takes a village, but, uh, we, you know, we work with great doctors, you know, uh, you working with yourself, working with the guys at Covalent Careers. Um, you know, it's really been a, been a fun event. So, um, so thanks for having me on and, uh, good luck with the rest of the program. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Bye. Right. All righty. Well, that was Austin. And so everybody check out the SL800 and, and this, this camera, which now I'm really curious about. I kind of want to go in there and see it. Um, we've seen so many jury rigged <laughs> solutions for this with slit lamps in the past that I, it would be nice to see a native one. And the fact that it can actually take pictures within the video stream, almost like a really good SLR camera, is really interesting. Uh, so you don't have to actually stop to take the picture. You can just press it while you're taking video. It was really cool. Um, yeah, now I really want to go do, you know, look at it. Um, a high frame rate camera coupled with these optics must be incredible. I'm surprised they actually haven't uh, started publishing stuff on YouTube just to show people what it looks like because it's uh, pretty amazing. Okay, and I think we're just about, it's just about 1.30, I think. So we're just about uh, in time for our final interview of the day, I think. Uh, let me see if people are there. So, so Darren and Jennifer, are you guys there? Yes. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Great. Excellent. And Darren, are you there? I am. Oh, Hello. Awesome. Hey, good to see you. This is a uh, thanks for having us. It's it's been a it's been a really fun day today. I hope you guys have had a good experience so far being here today. Yeah, it's been awesome. I just watched a couple of the lectures are really great. Good info. Great. Yeah, I actually had mine running behind me while I was scanning patients. So <laughs> That's hilarious. So you guys actually gave a talk. I'm going to put it up on the screen here so people can just see what, what you're all about. So uh, OCT interpretation from anterior to posterior. And hilariously, I like to mention to people on ODWire, whenever we run an OCT interpretation lecture, they are always the best attended. It seems like there is like a, a bottomless need for people to, to you know, study OCT interpretation. I don't know if you guys have seen that too. Just people love watching it. Definitely. Yeah, I feel like OCT interpretation is something that every day I'm learning something new. So I feel like, you know, we all need a lot of education and a lot of time staring at OCTs to really feel comfortable. Right. Well, maybe you can give people background. So what is your background, your, your, your clinical backgrounds? How did you, you come to do this today? Um, so I am Jennifer Gold. I am the chief of the advanced care service at SUNY College of Optometry. Um, so I'm an optometrist here. I see patients in the glaucoma clinic, um, our retina clinic and our dry and cataract. So I have a lot of different variety of things that I see. Um, I actually have an engineering background and for some reason, just imaging is like the one thing that really kind of made me excited. So I love going through images and really trying to figure out what kind of, you know, how to make things make sense. And I think that OCT really is the one thing that opens up kind of combining the pathophysiology of the disease and the anatomy of, of the, you know, the eye and the disease itself together. So OCT is really my favorite. Great. And how about you, Darren? Um, so I, I've been in ophthalmology for about 30 years now, and I started out uh, as a surgical nurse in the military. So I had the medical background coming into it, but I didn't have the technology background, so to speak. And I took my first fundus photograph in 1990 uh, on an old Zeiss camera actually it was a, it was a, it was an FF3 that I shot it on and uh, I was hooked from then on and I've just been trying to stay ahead of the curve and really learning what I can when these new technologies come out and uh, it's been very very exciting especially the last decade yep yeah it seems like the technology curve has really taken off now in this past decade so it's it's become where OCT once was sort of an exotic thing now it's you know, every it's just everywhere um, so right. yeah. Things really have changed. So I'm kind of curious now with COVID going on, 
you know, how has this impacted, you know, your practices and your, and your, uh, you know, your use of OCT in the office? Well, I can speak for, in our practice, I, I work in a multi-specialty practice with nine, nine physicians and um, we, we use the OCT quite a bit anyway, and OCT and geography, but it has really ramped up lately now that we, we went through sort of this partial shutdown and now we're sort of getting the backlog patients through. But, uh, but it, it, we're still doing as much OCT as we had before. We're scanning every patient that we see that comes through the door in the retina clinic part of it anyway. Uh, but there's a little more time between patients because of new cleaning methods, uh, new protocols for that sort of thing. Uh, so we've learned to really move fast. Um, but it's been instrumental in the fact that, especially our OCTA, that we no longer really have to do a lot of diangiography and get sort of that, that 10, 15 minutes one-on-one -on -one with a patient that close because OCT angiography really gives us much more information. Um, and we can do that, you know, on our angioplex in six seconds and get a great, get the answer we're looking for. Right. Yeah, I actually feel the exact same way. You know, with COVID, obviously, we've had a variant of number of patients we're seeing. And, you know, right now we're seeing probably about 50% of our typical load. Um, but OC, you know, we're still imaging a lot. We're still doing a lot of OCTs. But I feel like we definitely have um, reduced the number of fluorescent angiograms that are needed. Not to say that they're not needed at all. But with our OCTA, we definitely can figure out, you know, what disease it is, how to treat it, especially now that most of our treatment modality is going with intravitreal injections. It makes things a lot easier than needing to know exactly a focal spot of leakage. Right. And I'm going to put up on the screen here for people who haven't, you know, sort of seen it with OCTA, because amazingly, you know, I, I was shocked actually to learn that there still are people who don't even use OCT regularly in their practice, let alone OCTA. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I'm putting up pictures of the series here just so people can see and understand, um, you know, with the, the new units, how quickly can you actually get the angiography scans? Is, is, does it take like 30 seconds or less? A lot less. I mean, it depends on what you're doing, what scan protocol you're using, obviously. But uh, but we typically in in the practice I'm in, we depending on the disease, we'll do a three millimeter, or we'll do a uh, an eight by eight millimeter uh, square uh, uh, image, and these are, each take literally six seven seconds to get through, and, and most patients seem to tolerate it incredibly well. Um, so so we're able to put patients through very quickly. Wow. And and I have to say that. Um, We've had our, we actually had our angioplex as soon as it was FDA approved. We got it actually Christmas Eve is when we paid for it. Uh, so we got it pretty quick uh, uh, right after it was approved. And we just uh, basically scanned every patient that came through the door to see what we could see. Um, and we've been enjoying it ever since. And uh, uh, like you said, I'm a little bit amazed at the practices that I go in and consult on that, that have it and don't use it to its full potential. Um, so hopefully we're getting some words out there. Yep. And, uh, you know, as, as I'm looking at this and I saw your lecture, I kind of, you know, peered in, right? I get a little sneak peek of everything here. Um, the pictures that, that you guys get are astounding, the clarity of, of the images that you're getting. Do you have any tips for everyone who may be, you know, either just getting started or who haven't really refined their, their methods for, for getting the best quality out of their OCT images? Well, I can tell you from my, uh, my perspective, I would... Like, I like scanning patients before anything happens to them, before they get dilated, before they get applinated, before their tear film dries out, that sort of thing. So I, I've actually changed our practice flow that when the patients come into retina, the first thing they do is get an OCT. Hmm. Then they move on from there or OCT and geography along with that. So I'm getting the best view I possibly can through that cornea, through that tear film. That's one of the biggest things that I can, I can advise. Yeah, I think that's great too. We actually leave a bottle of artificial tear sitting right next to our OCT too, because a lot of times, even if you do grab them right at the beginning of their practice or their day, um, you know, they still have, if they have corneal issues, it definitely makes a big difference to get that artificial tear in. So that's helpful. And then also, you know, just, I think a lot of communication of exactly what needs to be imaged is important because, you know, I, you know, I was yesterday teaching my students and I'm, you know, if we have a coronal nevus that we're trying to image and it's two disc diameters superior to the fovea, we really need to guide, you know, imaging to make sure that we get things in the right place. It's well centered. Um, and so just being kind of supportive and, and working really with the uh, technicians that are taking the images is really important. Right. So I know that your, your lecture that you guys gave was like an hour long, but if you had to give like three top tips for interpretation, and I know it's almost impossible, right? Because again, this, this subject is almost limitless. <laughs> but, you know, if you had to just, you know, give three top tips off the top of your head, uh, you know, for folks who are doing interpretation, what would it be? Yeah, I think uh, Darren kind of alluded to this, is that you just need to image everybody. 
And when you're imaging everybody, you image normal and you image abnormal, and you really have to just see the variance of everything. Because when you start to take a look, you know, you'll, you'll notice much more subtle changes um, in the outer retina, the inner retina, when you really are used to looking at a lot of different images. Mm. Um, and that, that can really kind of help your prognosis of patients, you know, predicting visual acuity, a lot of different aspects. If you really kind of have a good sense of what normal is, you'll be able to pick up the abnormal much easier. Right. I agree. And I think my three tips are, are pretty easy. It's communication, education, and push push past what you know. So really push the boundaries of what you do and don't just get into that rut of just doing the same thing on every single patient or every single pathology. Really push past it and see what more you can do with this equipment. Um, just because it says this is what it's good for doesn't mean that's all it can do. Right. And I think, of course, as the years pass, you, you see the, the functionality expanding. So don't just kind of get stuck in a rut with what you have now, right? right? Just look, look to the future as well. Um, and as, exactly. the, as the capabilities expand, definitely take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. Great. Yep, All definitely. right. Well, thank you guys so much for being here today. And thank you for your lecture. And I hope everyone has sort of popped in to watch it because, uh, yeah, the, the images that you guys get are great. And I'm sure the, the, the tips that people can take home are also going to be fantastic. So thank you again for being here today. All right. Thank you. Great. Nice to meet you, Adam. Okay. So that was great. So yeah, so definitely if you haven't seen their lecture, go in and, and look because wow, um, you know, it's, uh, and I, I always, you know, think, well, you know, it's uh, everybody takes the same kind of pictures, right? No, no, that's not the case. <laughs> um, you know, there, there is definitely uh, an art to doing it properly and, and they have it nailed. So you really want to go check out their lecture. It's really neat stuff. Um, so I guess we're getting to the end of the, the conference here today. Um, so, you know, just in wrapping up, I think, you know, we've learned a lot and if we, again, if you take, if you only take one thing away from what's been happening here today, the Med Support Now page on Zeiss is, is really the one that you should go to. So you can see the URL up there, uh, or if you type into Google Zeiss uh, Med Support Now, it'll take you to this, this page. Um, this is where you're going to get all the information about adapting to the new normal. Um, with cleaning advice, you'll learn about breath shields where you can get them right from Zeiss's site and drapes and so forth, and uh, best practices for social distancing with the equipment that people are using. So this is sort of the one-stop shop, including education and you know our friends at Covalent Careers who produced this event today. So kudos to them for producing a fun event. Um, they also have a professional education portal that they built for Zeiss, uh, where they, they're storing a lot of this education where you can go and learn more. So pretty neat stuff, go and check it out. You can go right to their site at Covalent Careers. You can see right up there. And, and it goes on and on. As you can see, Zeiss has been very busy over these last several months of the pandemic. They have produced probably more educational material than any company in eye care. I think that's, that's a pretty safe statement to say uh, during this time of the pandemic. It's amazing how they've all sort of come together to produce all this stuff uh, for folks. And just a reminder that the exhibit hall is still open if you wanna go in. Uh, you know, you can check out uh, all of the equipment like the Cirrus 6000 and the Claris 500. Um, the HFA, which we've been talking about a lot today, talking about CETA faster and why this is a very important thing for your practice now, particularly in the era where you're trying to move people through as fast as you can. Uh, you know, field exams take a very long time and anything you can do to cut down the time is an important thing. So definitely check it out and check out CETA faster and why it's really useful. And again, we just spoke to Austin a little while back about the SL800 slit lamp. So yes, there are advances in slit lamp te technology. Um, been around for a long time, but as you can see, just like the automobile, right, there are constant advances. Uh, and if you look at the optics on this thing, you'll, you'll see what they are in addition to the ergonomic benefits. And as Austin just let us know, they now have an integrated camera for the slit lamp, which works with all Zeiss slit lamps, which is a, it sounds like a really cool solution versus the sort of ad hoc thing that most people have been doing. Um, and again, shout out to the forum software, which ties all of the data together from all the instruments and gives you this longitudinal view of your patients. Uh, so definitely also something to check out. And as we learned today, people are implementing this, even if they uh, during the pandemic, held off implementing any new hardware, a lot of folks have been upgrading the software and installing Forum just so they can get a better handle on their data and improve their workflow. Um, and so I guess that is about it. I think we've, we've reached the sort of end of our show. Um, I hope all of you have had a really great time here today. 
You know, if you have any questions or comments, you always know where to find me on ODWire or CEWire. Uh, and, and I think that's about it. So again, thank you everyone for being here today and I'm sure I'll catch up with you online.